Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the regular meeting of the Wareham School Committee. It's February, it's uh, March, March 9th, Wednesday night, uh, and it is seven o'clock somewhere. Um, at this particular point in time, uh, does anyone have uh, public participation? If so, would you please come forward and identify yourself? Seeing none, uh, we go to good news, Dr. Rabinovich. Yes, um, recently um, I received a final summary of the Nye scholarships awarded to seven graduates of the class of 2005. Uh, from Wareham High School. The seven students who received these scholarships attended Northeastern, Boston College, Boston University, St. Leo's University, um, University of Mass Dartmouth, and University of Mass Bridgewater, and UMass Amherst. After four years, they all graduated and had an average GPA of 3.49. Oh, great. So as far as answering, do we prepare students um, for a four-year university to do well? I think that answers it. Um, also from the class of 2006, um, seven graduates from Wareham High showed attendance at University of Maine, Marquette, Loyola, St. Michael's College, Holy Cross, Bentley College, and Quin Quinnipiac. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. I can't say that word. After four years, they all graduated and had an average GPA of 3.33. So both years, a solid B average. Um, I think that's great. So I think that's good news. Very good. Yes. Uh, does anyone else on the committee have good news? I do. I just want to mention the, uh, the Viking Theater last week did their play, um, Voices of 9-11. Very, very moving um, and very significant, this being the 10-year anniversary. Kids did a great job. They spent Saturday at their um, their festival at Pace High School and had an absolutely wonderful time. Uh, they are completely exhausted and worn out, but just they did a great job. It was very moving, and you know, you, it seems like yesterday, but you think about how little they were when 9-11 when occurred, and uh, they, was, they did a great job handling it. So yeah, I was very great. proud of them, very yeah. proud of them. We, we, there's a great group of kids in their they organization. Are. They're just having a ball. Um, anyone else have good news? Jeff? Oh, I'll get to you. Jeff? Uh, out very quickly. I just happened to notice our kids managed to go successfully all the way to Greece and come back and are still smiling. <laughs> so our gamble, on still, our gamble still standing. In, right. And our gamble in approving that trip turned out to have been a good one. Excellent. I uh, just wanted to mention that on Monday, um, and as a follow-up to the Martin Luther King breakfast and the uh, award winners there, there was a Martin Luther King Jr. Community Youth Forum that was held um, this past Monday where um, kids that represented each one of the schools came together and um, gave the administration um, and the community members uh, some very uh, strong feedback on what Wareham is doing and not doing um, uh, to help with their success. Um, I hope that it, it continues um, with this group um, because I think that they, they just, they had a lot of insight on what we could do better for them. Um, and so the notes are going to be circulated, but um, I just wanted to mention um, how proud I was to be in that room with them and, and really see the leadership of, of that group. Just to, if I can on that particular note, the um, planning committee um, was also very pleased with um, how the, the morning went and the participation of the students. So once we have the data um, all typed up, we've given it to somebody to type up for us, um, the planning committee is going to get back together again, um, the same planning group that put together the Martin Luther King celebration, and we'll then decide next steps about involving students and about sharing the information with various town boards. So the school committee will be made aware of it. Perhaps the community um, committee uh, will get it. And um, you know we can look at the next steps and how do we get from um, 
those thoughts to some concrete action steps um, and so forth. So I think it was a great first start. I mean, we've been talking about it for three years that we wanted to do more than just give out an award. Um, and I think this was a great first step of listening, um, giving youth a voice is what it was about. Ken? Um, good news took place here a couple of weeks ago. The mm -hmm. Stop the Violence, Increase the Peace rally uh, was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Wendy Montero spoke um, about the Scotty Montero um, incident that was very moving. And our guest speaker, Chris Herron, was was very good. Um, hopefully, I'd like to work with the, the schools and maybe have Chris come back at some point uh, where the audience is the kids. And uh, there were a lot of adults in the uh, audience that day, but they're part of the process too. So the rally went, uh, went very good, a lot of support. Uh, members of the, uh, the Board of Selectmen helped out, the police department. Um, I'm not going to start naming everybody because you always miss uh, someone. Dr. Rabinovich um, was there, very supportive in our use of the schools um, because we had a last minute uh, problem with the, uh, the high school gymnasium. But that's a, a big start, that rally, and hopefully um, there'll be more events coming up uh, down the road where we can keep that theme going and try to get more people involved. No, that was very good. I heard nothing but good things about it. And unfortunately, I was in Texas at the time, um, so um, I couldn't attend, but I look forward to attending the next rally. I really do. Um, everything, I, Everyone I talked to said it was uh, really a good thing, so thank you for representing the school committee. I don't see any gifts from Texas, though. No gifts. Uh, well, I, yeah, well, tables, yeah, no, no gifts from Texas. Um, well, some of the Dallas Cowboy <laughs> chili is here, if you're a <laughs> Um Good news. Well, um, kind of old news, but it's still good news. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the boys and girls basketball team for winning the league championship and, and going to the quarterfinals in the tournament. Um, both the boys and girls uh, uh, had a fine season and represented uh, Wayham High School uh, with dignity and honor, so I think that that's a good thing. Uh, I'd like to wish uh, the Ducker kids at state competition this weekend success. I got a bunch of kids competing in uh, marketing and management activities, so um, we hope that they do well this weekend. So that's my good news. Uh, minutes of the meeting, February 9, 2011. Um, we've all had a chance to read them over. Any um, errors, omissions, deletions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero zero. All right. Uh, report of the chair. Uh, at this particular time, um, I, I really don't have uh, anything to report. Uh, so uh, we'll go right on to the report of the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to just give some uh, general updates about some building issues. Uh, first one had to do with the Ethel E. Hammond School. Uh, Mrs. Siemens and I um, met with the staff of the Hammond School on February 14th um, regarding the many um, gas odors mm -hmm. that have caused the evacuation of the school. Um, as a result of the meeting, um, we had a technician from the Mass Restaurant and Equipment Service Company come to check out the stove. Mrs. Siemens met with him. I called him and talked with him on the phone. The technician has told us that um, he did routine maintenance and the stove and oven are safe to operate and in um, good working order. Um, even though they are quite old, um, the last gas odor it really wasn't the stove. Um, it was a coupling that comes into where the stove is. And just because of the heat in the kitchen and then the cold at night, that coupling kind of loosened a little bit and um, that caused the odor. And every time you have a gas odor, you have to evacuate. And um, We had uh, Chief Anderson come and talk with the uh, teachers as well. And he explained to them that because of 
some situations that caused a, a house to explode. They have actually put in more of that, um, the material that causes the gas to smell. So a very small amount of gas now will have a much larger odor than it had before. That's on purpose. So um, anybody that deals with gas knows sometimes when you um, go to turn on a stove or something, the ignition may take a second or two. And so that gas, the way that building is set up with two sets of stairways, it acts as a chimney and it brings the smells right upstairs. So. Um, we are, you know, we're aware of it. Um, we took it serious. And um, what I think exacerbated the situation is that the last time we had to take children out of the building because of all the snow and ice, um, we found that when the town plows, um, even though the sidewalks had been cleared, um, the snow goes back onto the sidewalks. And so that, you know, people had to go out in the street or over the snowbank. So um, we'll be meeting with Mr. Gifford um, from DPW to ask for them to plow it the opposite way so the snow doesn't go on to the um, sidewalk that the students are going to need for emergency um, egress. And there was some signage issues that we will be handling as well. So that issue has been taken care of. Um, as Ken mentioned, um, the, you know, he called me, I think it was 1 o'clock on the day of the event to tell me that they had to move um, the event from the high school to the middle school um, and the JBA games because we had water entry into the gymnasium at the high school. Um, the high school roof ha is a rubber roof that is held on by stone and there is um, insulation underneath it. To make a long story short, it is difficult with that kind of a roof to find out exactly where your leaks are unless you peel back the rubber um, envelope. And um, so I've asked Scott to get um, the estimates about how we can do that, how much that's going to cost, because uh, we don't want to go into next year and having to um, cancel events um, because of water entry and into that building. The building is in otherwise great shape. And um, if we need, we may have to put in a uh, mass uh, building association um, request just for the roof uh, if it, you know, needs serious. And it's too bad. It's only about 20 years old, but um, roofs can be problematic. Especially flat ones. Yes. <laughs> Uh, budget update. After four meetings with the um, ad hoc committee, Mr. Andrews and I have scheduled and today held our first uh, private meeting um, to try to get to a number. And the meeting went well. Um, and um, he and I will be meeting again. Um, probably in um, a week and a half after he has a chance to meet with some people at the State House to get a better feel for what the um, number will be from the House to make sure that that is similar to the Governor's number. Um, and so we had a very good conversation today and I will report at our next meeting how my next meeting has gone. Deputy Benovich, one question on that. Is the Ad Hoc Committee scheduled to meet again? The ad hoc committee is in hiatus pending the town administrator and I coming to some um, number at this point. Or if we can't come up with a number, we will come back to the group. So either way, we'll be going back. But the town administrator felt that some time for he and I to meet on multiple occasions would be helpful uh, before we come back to the ad hoc. And I concur with that. Continue. Uh, this is again, as you say, old news. Uh, but the drug sweep at Wareham High School took place uh, on the morning of February 17th. 16 canine units from various Massachusetts cities and towns uh, partnered with the Wareham Police Department and the Wareham school officials to search for Ill illegal drugs at Wareham High School. 
The search resulted in the issuance of Wareham Town bylaw citations to 11 students for possession. So population is approximately 840 students, and there were 11 citations given. And things went as well as can be expected, and principal let me know that by 1045 that morning, things were back to regular operations and education was continuing. Can you mention whether or not those citations came for substance in the school or outside the school? There was a mixture, but the majority of them were in vehicles. The way these are done, they're passive, and therefore this does not find anything on a person. These were either found in vehicles or in backpacks. So a class would be asked to keep all of their belongings in the room, leave the room, the dog would come in and do what they do, and then once they identified a particular bag, then police with school officials would do the search and then meet with the student. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman. This sweep, does it reveal any alcohol or is this drugs only? I believe this is drugs only, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm looking at Rachel to see if she knows the difference. So the canine dog is naturally sniffing for drugs, but in the search, I would imagine searches through the lockers and all of that? There was. I thought there was one that they found in a car. That is correct. Because they smelled the drugs, and then in turn they went through the car, and then they found alcohol. I'm not sure who it was, but I just heard that that occurred. And another object that did not belong in the school. Thank you. But can I just make a point on that? It's gotten a lot of press, and people stop me and have been asking me questions about it, and they say, what's the deal? Are you concerned about it and so forth? And I try to be as honest as I can. But the one thing I want to tell the public, if they're watching, is that this is not new. These sweeps and the dogs have been coming in for years. It's part of the Safe School Initiative, and I know Wareham has been doing it. We did it down at Sandwich when I was principal 100 years ago. So it's something that is done, and it is done on a regular basis. So I don't want people to get concerned that this is some kind of a new thing. It's just part of operating a public school. Dr. Sylvia, I've been in the district 19 years. It has been occurring all 19 years. In fact, I recall the school committee meeting where the policy was changed because of the dogs and so that we made sure that it was a passive. And when I was at the middle school, each and every year of the 12 years, we also did it at the middle school. So, yes, it is an ongoing thing. But it was ramped up. I will give credit where credit is due, that where we might have had six or seven dogs before, there were 16 dogs this time. So it was a much more thorough. Dogs get tired after a time. So, you know, you had enough that you could rest them and then be fresh. So we truly believe that we found what was there, and we don't know, and neither does anybody else, when we'll be doing it again. It could be tomorrow. It could be five weeks from today. And that's the way we keep it so that students will know they should not bring things that don't belong to school. Very good. Continue. And Rhonda took my thunder on the Martin Luther King community thing, which is great. And once again, I thought that that was a nice community activity. The people that are on this planning group and have been for the last three years, we have the Boys and Girls Club that have taken the lead with Barbara Sullivan. We've had the YMCA, at least one member of their staff have been to all of our planning meetings. We've had Make Peace having a representative there. 
we've had one or two members of the clergy. Um, I think it's called WACA, which is the uh, Wareham Area Clergy Association, has a member at this group and one member of the school department. And we've worked together to plan these events, um, to acknowledge students, to have role models come and speak to the students, and now to listen to the students' voice. So um, I think it's a great activity. That's a tough name. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Got to be careful. Mr. Chair? Through you, just to add one other thing. Um, what was interesting, and Kenny, this goes to you to kind of tie in with what you were saying under good news, that um, there was talk around what services are not available to children, what are things that prevent them from learning, things like that. And the overwhelming um, response from the kids when it came to what is, um, what is, what is not helping them move forward had a lot to do with bullying and violence and cyberbullying and you know Fears. yep so the the obstacles um, had a lot to do around that and when they talked about some of the good things going on um, you know it, it was a lot of the programs that that currently exist today but um, I just found that interesting and and definitely we need to somehow tie all of that in together with the work that's being done at a community level and really bring it um, to what uh, what the students are saying and uh, mr. Fonts, just um, my thinking is that once we've uh, reported out these findings and had a, a general meeting um, we may involve the students again uh, again to refine them and maybe a wider audience of students but then um, I'm thinking that this planning that planning group the Martin Luther King planning group and that um, youth sports committee that we put together last year might get together because many of the recommendations of the students had to do with um, for instance child does well goes through JBA is likes to play basketball but yet doesn't have the skill to make varsity team Th there's a gap in um, places to be able to uh, continue to participate and I just mentioned basketball because you're here but I'm sure the same thing can be said for other sports so students are looking for and they said you know the why is great but the why has a lot of people there in the afternoons they're looking for somewhere else that they can congregate to do healthy activities where there are adult mentors as you know um, so a safe place. A safe where, place. Yep. And it goes to the safety issue as well. Um, and so there are some ideas percolating, and uh, I think when we all get together, you know, maybe a time to talk about a multi-use um, facility um, that can be a place for kids to congregate and to be in these activities. Mm -hmm. So. I'll just okay. wet your appetites and then we'll wait to see. Okay, next on the agenda, report of the student representative. Um, well, not much has really been happening lately, though the um, talent show will be happening and tryouts for high school students will be taking place on March 22nd, which I believe is a Tuesday after school. And then the actual talent show itself will be held in the auditorium around 6.30 on April 2nd. And so that will be starting up. And also on a more, uh, I guess, not as light note, um, MCAS for sophomores <laughs> is at the end of this month. Just a reminder. So. And everyone's excited about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> so not much really to say. Everything's running smoothly. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good news. That's good news. <laughs> I guess that's good news. Everything's running smoothly. Any questions for the student representative? Okay, moving right along. Oh, we're well, way ahead of schedule. That's good. Um, response to intervention, Mr. Luzon. Okay, good evening. Good evening. It has been a, uh, a challenge tonight because we have a couple of technical difficulties that we've done a workarounds. So don't hopefully, let, this don't let technology get in the way of a good presentation. And you know, <laughs> if I couldn't have picked a better way of doing this, so that you could say that. <laughs> um, but I think, but I think we're all set. Okay. 
So tonight we are going to talk about response to intervention and a framework for delivering instruction to all students. And, and I would really like to highlight the fact that, that this is really for all students. Today what I'd like to be able to talk to you about is really w w just what RTI is, response to intervention truly is. <clears throat> Why RTI is the right framework to use for Wareham, when and where that implementation will occur, understand how it will roll out and what our partnership with Teachers 21 will be, review how it can be funded both in transition and long term. And that's a very important piece when you're talking about the funding side of this because there's a, there's a great difference between how you need to fund it up front as you roll it out and how you fund it yeah. as you move forward. And yeah. So we're going to talk about all of that, but that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. I'd also, and, I'm, and I yeah. meant to do it at the beginning because they'll shoot me, I already uh, owe them both dinner, uh, yeah. but Joan Siemens and Chris Panarisi, uh, the two elementary principals are here to be able to help answer questions at the end and to, to share in our conversation because we've really been working on this as a team and feel that, uh, that we're, we're really in a good spot at this point. So I want to just give you some common understandings. I'm going to show you, hopefully, about a 10 minute, a little less than a 10 minute video of Lehigh University's efforts and they're working with um, local school systems in the Pennsylvania area, but a nice overview of RTI. Then we're going to talk about some of the common terms and as I said, the our partnership with Teachers 21 and, and just what things are going to look like over the next two, two and a half years around response to intervention. Some common understandings of what RTI is. It is a regular instructional framework and it's designed for all students. It's not just designed for children with special needs. It's not just designed for children who are at risk, but it really is designed for all children, including the opportunities uh, in the scheduling of classrooms to be able to allow more uh, enrichment activities within the classrooms. It is based on the use of data, including universal screening and progress monitoring, two terms we'll talk about, research-based instruction, and a collaborative delivery of, of structured uniform curriculum by regular education, special education, and Title I staff. One of the things that um, school districts run into is often the instruction in those three areas, special education, regular education, and Title I, tend to be splintered. And an RTI model really brings them together so that you're really looking at a uniform curriculum and all of the people, all of the instructors are using the same base to be able to provide their, their instruction. It is dependent on an effective core curriculum and well differentiated instruction meeting the needs of at least 80% of the students and you're going to hear a lot about this. While targeted interventions is delivered immediately to those students evidencing the need for an additional supplemental dose of instruction and this is about 15% of the population. And finally, an intensive intervention which meets the needs of the most at-risk children. The significant thing about this is that this is all within the regular education model. We're not talking about those 5% being necessarily the, the students with special needs. They are the 5% that in a targeted area of instruction, they continually show that they are not getting it. They're not achieving mastery. And one of the core beliefs behind RTI is that students need multiple exposures to the same information. Some students get it first time around, 20 minutes, they got it. They mastered it, they're all set, they're ready to go. Other students need a second dose, and some students even need a third dose. But it needs to be targeted, and it needs to be immediate. And that is the framework of RTI, that you make sure that it is targeted and it is immediate. Some common understandings of what RTI is not it is not special education. Although you may see instruction provided by inst special education staff and Title I staff in itself, it is not special education. It's not an IEP, it's not the evaluation process. It's a way of being able to provide targeted instruction quickly within the regular education framework. It is not a program. We're not buying it. It doesn't come in a box. It's not a program. It's not a series, it's not a workbook, it's not a kit. It is not new. It is a framework that's put together, that puts together the best of what we know about how children learn. It is not a standalone model. 
It requires a collaboration among all administrative, professional, and paraprofessional staff that deliver a core curriculum as well as targeted and intensive supplemental interventions following a uniform, clear scope and sequence that assures that all students will indeed respond to the interventions. This is, this is a scope and sequence. This is knowing exactly what people need to be teaching and what sequence they need to teach it in and what the supplemental instruction needs to be when somebody doesn't quite get it in that first dose of instruction. So we t it's often talked about as a, a three-tier model or a multi-tier instructional model. You'll hear multi-tier instructional model, you'll hear response to intervention, you'll hear RTI. They all mean the same thing. They mean all students get the first tier of instruction, all students. Those students who need some targeted intervention may get a second tier, and those students who need intensive intervention will get a third tier. But the key difference in what we're used to is that all students receive that first tier of core instruction. So they have the same exposure from the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about the three tiers. Tier one is called universal interventions. The definition is that students who are making expected progress in the general education curriculum, this is, these, are the these are all students receiving that core instruction. These are school-wide interventions that are available for all students. They are differentiated. They have clear expectations. They're effective student, there are effective student supports. There are benchmark assessments. There's universal prevention, and there's a delivery of a curriculum that allows mastery of, of content to at least 80% of the population and requires revision of scope and sequence to maintain the level. There are two facets that, that allow children to succeed. One, beyond them being attentive and ready to learn when they sit in those seats, one of them is effective teaching models, differentiated instruction, being able to pre present the information in an effective way. The second is that our curriculum meets the needs of 80% of those students in that first exposure, in that first tier of instruction. You're going to hear about, and I'll talk about it in a little while, and I'm sure Chris and Joan will talk about it as well, that there is this rule of fidelity, they call it, of 80-15-5. If we don't meet the needs of 80% of the kids in that tier one, in the core curriculum, then we need to adjust our curriculum. If we don't meet the needs of at least 15% or at max 15% of the kids in Tier 2, we need to adjust what we're doing in Tier 2 and the same for Tier 3. But you can't overload the model as we've overloaded special education over the years because it becomes less and less effective. The classroom is the place to learn. The classroom is the place where you want to reach 80% of the children. And if you're not doing that, we need to be able to be more careful about um, adjusting the curriculum, adjusting the, the ver various instructional strategies. Tier two is called strategic and targeted interventions, academic and behavioral interventions, methodologies and practices designed for students not making expected progress in the delivery of the core curriculum. This is about 10 to 15 percent of the students. This allows for increased opportunities to learn at least an additional 30 minute dose of instruction. So if today in reading we're doing the OA sound, in the, core, in the core instruction and there are five or six kids who don't get it, there's an opportunity for them to have an additional dose of the instruction specifically around the OA sound. And again, a third dose if that's necessary. But the idea is if somebody doesn't get it, we can't say kids learn in 30 minute doses. You know, we, we give them 30 minutes. If they learn it, great. If they don't, we've got a problem. We need to be able to say using data, here's what we're doing for the kids. In our first dose of instruction, we need to make sure that about 80% of the kids get that first, that mastery in that first dose. And if not, we need to be able to have instruction continue so that those kids get it in additional doses. Mo for many, many kids, that's what they need is just more exposure to the same material. Increased instructional time, a second dose that's targeted towards the area of need and immediate, I already said that. Increased assessment. This is data driven. It is important for us to look at through prog uh, universal screening, progress monitoring, to make sure that we really understand what children are learning and what they're not learning. Is it the whole lesson or is it one piece of the lesson? Do we need to focus more on that? Do we need to adjust the, the sequence of the instruction so that 
kids are more successful in being able to learn it. Um, and it needs to be differentiated based on students' learning styles. Tier three are an intensive intervention, academic strategies, methodologies, and practices designed for students significantly lacking behind established grade level benchmarks in the general education curriculum. About three to five percent of the students should need to have this, no more than three to five percent of the students should need this level of intervention. This includes, again, in, in, increased uh, direct instructional time and more immediate and corrective feedback. More frequent pro progress monitoring as much as two or three times a week. You, this is, these are the kids that are really at risk and you need to make sure that you're monitoring how they're doing um, several times a week. This is the core curriculum plus intensive intervention. Remember, these children who are really, really struggling need to get the classroom instruction as well as these these multiple tiers of instruction to go along with it. So this is where it gets tricky. I'd like to have you look at a, a video. I should have brought you popcorn, I apologize. It is a 10 minute video, but I think it will give you a good view of RTI in actually three elementary schools that worked with part, through a partnership with Lehigh University um, the Center for Promoting Research to Practice. And I think you'll enjoy the, the video and, and get a little bit of an idea of what this is all about. And all I need to do is push some buttons and hope they... Before you do that, let me invite everyone for popcorn. I oh, know, I mean cookies and, <laughs> and coffee if they want it. Uh, be backstage here. Please feel free to help yourselves to the snacks. Okay. Mr. Ch excuse me, Mr. Chairman, do you want us to hold all our questions until the end? That would be good. Thank you. So write them down. You may forget. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Write them down. I can't forget. I mean, I can't remember. But I forgot.
push each other. We know the younger we get kids, the younger we correct problems kids are having, the better chance we have of not having those kids have those problems later on in their school life or later on in their young adults and adolescent life.
So this is um, probably, as, as he said, this is one of the most important things that he has seen in 30 years. Um, in my three years here, I don't think you've seen me with a suit coat on, and, and it may be because it's one of the most important things I've seen in three years, but it really is because Scott Palladino's here, and he always looks so good <laughs> in a suit coat, so I thought I'd better keep up with him. <laughs> not how you feel, it's how you walk. Let's go back to, if we could, just um, <clears throat> just some key phrases, because again, tonight is really about giving you some of the, some of the nuts and bolts of response to intervention or multi-tiered instruction. So some of the words, and we're not going to define all of these, but some of the words you hear and will continue to hear are universal screening, early intervening, as opposed to early intervention that all of us think is for young children. Early intervening means intervening immediately when students begin to have trouble, not, not specifically for young children. Multiple exposures, the 80-15-5 fidelity of curriculum, I mentioned earlier, we need to be able to make sure these numbers look good. The three of us went to a workshop several weeks ago that the uh, presenter was extremely proud to say that their numbers, and I won't remember the numbers exactly, but they were more like 90, you know, eight and two or something like that, meaning that 90% of the children were responding well to the instruction in the core classrooms, in the classroom, and less and less children needed the multiple tiers of instruction. But the sort of cutoff point is for us to be able to stay with the 80-15-5 fidelity of curriculum. Targeted instruction is one of our new words. Progress monitoring, not necessarily new. Differentiation, all important pieces. Reallocation of instructional resources we're going to talk a lot about in just a little bit. And collaboration, an educational model, not a special education model, not a Title I or a regular education model. It's an education model. And as I think you heard the um, director of the Bureau of Special Education for the state of Pennsylvania say, this is, this is new. We lived, we have lived in the world of regular education and special education. And this is really about us not having just those two worlds anymore, but doing much, much more, much more quickly for students. So Wareham, <clears throat> some of the key concepts in Wareham, uh, really there are two focal areas. One of them is around professional development, again, targeted professional development about RTI, and a service rollout for beginning with English language arts as the first area at the elementary level that we're going to work at. We can't do it all at one time. So we have worked together to identify the areas that we feel that we need to start with and to, to roll this out over, over time. Not a lot of time, but over time. Reallocation of resources is a very important part of this. Certainly classroom instructional staff are going to have to look at how they teach, how they set up their classrooms what is happening in their, in their classrooms in terms of the flow of children and so forth. Um, special education, I'm going to start to expect as early as next fall, start to expect uh, special education teachers to participate in providing tier three instruction. This is our ability to be able to use existing resources to, to provide these, uh, these interventions immediately. And the same with Title I resources, we're going to use Title I resources to provide the Tier two instruction for students. So we're trying to use as many of our, our, pres our present resources to be able to get this work done. But reallocation of resources is a very important part of our model. Partnership with Teachers 21. I will explain a little bit about Teachers 21. Uh, and we have worked with them. They've been out to see us. We've gone out to see them. Uh, they will be presenting a workshop on April 6th to our, our elementary staff, all of our elementary staff, about response to intervention. In our model, each teacher will receive 36 hours of targeted professional development for every teacher with an emphasis on Tier 1 instruction. What does that mean? That means doing all they can around scheduling, around differentiated instruction, around working with materials and students and collaborating with other people like Title I and special education staff to be able to provide effective instruction for kids. 36 hours every teacher. There will be an on-site RTI coach through Teachers 21 to be there to be able to make sure that this is all flowing well, that we don't start this thing off and we don't sustain it. We need to be able to make sure that we're doing it right, 
that we have some eyes from a distance the thirty thousand foot view how we doing and that will be the role of the r t i coach through teachers twenty one so trying to keep with preaching doing what i preach i've put some of the pieces of it into the smart goals format and you can see and i won't read it all because i can't see it well enough to read it all <laughs> that again there are two areas professional development and the rollout of um, of the RTI model those are the two pieces as you'll see in there there are defined action steps in our targets and timelines I'm going to talk about targets and timelines a little bit more the same with the service rollout we have we have two goals then around RTI the first is professional development second is the service rollout and you'll see that we are going to do a sequential rollout of these intervention services and the professional development over the course of the next couple of years. So reallocation of instructional resources. For Tier 1, the major focus of the trainings through uh, Teachers 21, which we have met with um, the folks at uh, Jerry Goldberg and uh, Gail Donovan, um, the focus will be around things like universal screening, differentiated instruction, classroom design and scheduling, service delivery shift from a, the binary regular education slash, slash special education model to a multi-tiered instructional model. It's good, that's a very big thing that it's going to take some people some time and, and effort and understanding to be able to shift from because we've lived with it for years. Uh, when I came into education in 1974, it was the beginnings of the binary system. We built up special education and the numbers of children in special education rose from three, four, five percent to 18, 19, 20 percent and beyond. So things have changed a great deal in the last 30, should it be 40 years? I guess it should be 40 almost. <clears throat> and um, working with RTI teams uh, and tier two and three providers um, as a professional learning community. Basically that means people being able to work together, whether it's the Title I person, the special education person, the classroom teachers uh, working in professional learning communities. Tier two, refocusing the primary role of Title I providers to provide targeted instruction. Tier three, progressive apportionment of special education staff responsibilities to intensive regular education instruction. It's a major change but it is using our best resources to be able to provide the most intensive, um, our best resources, by best I mean the ones that have the most training around the needs of children with, with special needs and, the, and, and educational needs. Teachers 21, <clears throat> we didn't um, pick Teachers 21 haphazardly. Teachers 21 has uh, a very, very very terrific uh, profile of the things that they've done to help school districts that are in, that are struggling and they have a number of different projects that they are working on but one of them is the R RTI project and you can see that there are a number of things that they focus on including professional development structures and systems a particular emphasis on tier one instruction helping classroom teachers to provide differentiated instruction, how to schedule their classes, how to work in centers so that the, the quality of instruction it, it continues to improve. Teachers 21's role in Wareham, RTI training with a strong emphasis on Tier 1 instruction. As I said, the, everybody will get 36 hours of training the, and you'll see that we're going to do this in cohorts, but that doesn't include just the teachers, that also includes the coaches uh, and, and interventionists so that everybody's talking the same language. Uh, we, we will have the very first group include all of the coaches and all of the building administrators as well so that everybody understands the, the, same, the same stuff. I'm sorry, Jeff. Am I no, that's okay. going away. RTI on-site coaching and consultation to each cohort during the first three months of service rollout plus summer work sessions for each of the next three years. So there'll be a minimum of three months that as a set of teachers begins to use RTI, rolls it out in their buildings, they will have a coach on site that will be there to be able to answer their questions and support what it is that they're trying to do. So 
they are not sort of left on their own and wondering what am I supposed to do next. So the chart may be a little confusing and certainly um, small print, which I'm famous for, but I'll, I'll try, to, um, try to go through it with you. As you can see in the upper yellow section here, all staff, all uh, K to five staff in April will receive a half day of uh, in-service training uh, by Jerry Goldberg of Teachers 21. This is sort of RTI 101, this is what we're trying to do, this is what it looks like, but all people will hear the same message at the same time. Shortly after that, the first cohort, and we have three cohorts, our first cohort for ELA, and we're only talking about ELA now, will be third grade teachers at both Minot and Deca schools, plus all coaches and administrators. So our first set of trainings will be third grade teachers, all, all coaches, all facilitators, and all administrators at the elementary level. So that 36 hour module will occur sometime between April and July. The service rollout, the actual provision of Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 instruction will begin in September of 2011 and continue on through that, um, through that year and, and beyond. But the actual rollout for third grade begins here September of 2011. At the same time that they begin their service rollout, the RTI coach comes on into play and is there and available to be able to help support them as they roll out those first three months. And also at the same time, the blue section here, cohort two. Cohort two at this point, provisionally, not set in stone, based on the needs of the two elementary buildings and, and Joan um, and Chris can talk about this, they've really looked at what their greatest needs are. So at this point, Chris is looking at grades one and two as her second rollout, her second cohort. Joan, because of her needs, is really looking at grades two and four. So at this point in time, we're looking at what the needs of the buildings are based on, on their data collection about who they would like to see in the sequence of what they'd like to see. Everybody's gonna be trained within the year, but they have decided how they want that to roll out. So cohort two begins their training in September and they complete it by January. They begin to roll out their services from January to June. So by, the, by June of next year, we will have three grade levels that will have full RTI models in place and in, um, in, in functioning by June. One of those will have the whole year. Grade three will have their RTI program in place all year. The, the other two grades, depending on whether it's whether it's um, one and two at Decus or it's two and four at Minot, will have a half a year under their belt. Training, again, uh, you can see the, uh, the service rollout is here. The coaching shifts now from the first cohort, coaching shifts down to the second cohort so that we have that person in place to support those folks as they roll out their first three months. Cohort three, the last remaining grades, elementary grades, <clears throat> the training for those teachers, the 36 hours of training occurs here sometime between January and July of 2012. And the rollout for their classrooms begins September 2012, so that by September 2012, all K to five grades will have a tiered instruction model in, but it'll just have been rolled out over the course of that year. The, the coaching will stay in place for all of the grades at that point. We'll have three months with the, the cohort, cohort three, but will be available for all cohorts during that full year and the following summer. So that if we've run into glitches, if we find that there are things that we need to be able to do that, that seems, to, you know, we just kind of fell through the cracks, we wanna make sure that we have an opportunity for those folks to be able to get additional training or additional support around what went well, what didn't go well, um, but we want to be able to have that kind of follow-up. So in a nutshell, looking right through August of 2013, this would be the rollout. In terms of funding, um, I've put, some, again, these are, these are 
most of them are not estimates, but these are the numbers that, um, that show us what we need. So we have the totals here, the amount of monies that it will cost, and the funding sources to be able to have those things occur. And you can see it's either RTT, IDEA, Title I as the primary funding sources for the various trainings and coaches uh, that we're talking about. So the, the costs are being um, driven into the, into the writing of those grants. So, so far we have completed a self-assessment of RTI readiness. We have building principals in the director of student services attending several workshops that we've been to related to RTI rollout, including some meetings with Teachers 21. Central administration teams um, have all met actually with Teachers 21. Grant development uh, to pay for a large portion of the cost of implementation is in place. Uh, we are contracted for the initial trainings. We're all set for Jerry Goldberg will be here April 6th. Um, for that training, and so we already have contracts in place for that. Um, planned for curriculum scope and sequence development for grades K-8 during uh, the summer of 2011 to make sure that that is in line to keep that 80-15 fidelity rule. Uh, and we have developed a rollout plan and obviously the presentation to you about that today. What you can expect to see in the upcoming weeks and months maybe years, April 6th will be the, the half-day training. Week of June 20th uh, is scheduled for cohort one. Um, so we do have a commitment from Teachers 21 to begin to provide that instruction. Fall of 2011, cohort two, 36 hours of training begins using some of the early re release time. Um, and also the rollout of grade three intervention uh, and the RTI coach will be in place by fall of 2011. January 2012, uh, cohort three begins their 36 hours of training that would run through the winter, late winter, early spring of uh, 2012. And the rollout of services for two additional grades from cohort two will occur. Summer of 2012, there'll be work sessions with RTI coach and consultant with teachers needing additional supports, wanting to make sure that nobody falls behind. If somebody's kind of struggling, we wanna make sure we have something in place to get them up and running. And then finally, fall of 2012, cohort three rolls out um, uh, grades, two addition, the final two additional grades uh, from, from the cohort three training. So again, fall 2012, everybody will be up and running grade three will have a year behind their belt. The other two grades, whether it's grade two and four or grade one and two at um, DECUS, will have now a half a year behind their belt and the third cohort will be beginning January, uh, September of 2012. So within a year, we have people at different stages of, of being ready to go. So I guess with that, I, I would, be happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna ask Joan and Chris, I know they're comfortable where they are. If they would like to come up here, don't wanna be pushy. Can I get this out of your way while you come up here though? Relief. Question. Uh, <clears throat> why don't we wait until the, uh, the whole presentation is done, and then we can just. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, let the principals. Oh, no, they're, they're just they're the just oh, oh they're just got resources, or you're not going to make I a presentation. I forgot to mention to them that they both have ten minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, I want to thank uh, principals for being here. Obviously, I know it's already late, yeah, and it is a school night, and we know we like to get to bed early. Um, so thank you, uh, Joan and, uh, and Chris, for being here. Um, I, I, I know that everyone has a lot of questions or comments or whatever, so why don't we go around the table? Everybody can ask a couple of questions, and we'll go around the table. Then if we have to do it again, we'll do it again. That way everyone gets a shot. And uh, so uh, we'll start with Jeff. A uh, couple of questions, and then we'll go to Rachel, and around the table we'll go back to Jeff. <laughs> if we need to. 
two, two questions. Uh, all right, my first two is this entire rollout appears to be focused on LEA, is that correct? That's correct. So that whatever issues that we have in the elementary schools that are not related to ELA will essentially be back while we're while we're doing this. Chris is looking at me like I've, that's <laughs> not true. So you wanna comment on what I just said, Chris? I, I think there's two things that we need to look at. We did just um, bring on a new mathematics series which is really working quite well. So um, even as a school right now, we've addressed the need. Gee, do we need an intervention block every single day for math? The, key, the kids seem to be catching on very good with following that very prescriptive um, series. So I think we're gonna see less of a need for an intervention block there. The other piece to that is, is I, don't, I can't see being trained at this type of intensity in differentiation and looking at your core curriculum and you know making all of the necessary changes that you need to make with your instruction and not having that carry over to other other content areas. I, I think that's just a natural process that's going to happen. You agree with that, John? To a degree, but I think we really have to focus on ELA for us. This is such an intense program and when we all went to one of the workshops, they focused for us on ELA and they were able to get the training and understand how to do RTI and the ELA model, and then they were able to carry it over into math. So once we get ELA down and up and running, then we can do RTI for math as well. But we can't do both. It, it's too all-encompassing and, and too much right now. So we have to really get good at the ELA portion. Okay, second question I have has to do with these percentages. Uh, they sound like they're really important now, so if, for example, it was 70% or 65%, then you would, it sounds like you would just <coughs> reduce the rigor so that you could get yourself first tier up to 80%, and yet you gave the example of 98% um, where they were really proud of that. But my reaction to that is, or maybe it's not rigorous enough if 98% are getting it. So I'm trying to get comfortable with this very, almost sounds rigid focus on this 80-15-5. Well, I, I can, I mean, all of us were, have, have heard a lot about this, but I can tell you that first of all, it wasn't 98%, it, wasn't it was 90%, 90, Nine zero, and then it was eight, and then it was two or three. So I didn't hear that. Yeah, okay. nine zero. So my point remains the same. Th it is, and and the idea is if if you overload tier two and tier three intervention, it's not going to work. You're going to have thirty kids in a tier two intervention, and there's going to be no small group instruction because you've got so many kids that are in those interventions. Number one. Number two, if the numbers are 60 or 70 percent that are responding well to t the, the core curriculum, then there are two things that could occur. One is looking at the professional development, looking at the teaching styles and strategies of the teachers to be certain that they're effective. And the second thing is looking at the scope and sequence of what's being taught to be sure that it doesn't need to be adjusted. So for example, if um, if there's a math concept taught and the scope and sequence is to teach this particular skill on Monday, this particular skill on Tuesday, this one Wednesday, this one Thursday, but the problem is the Tuesday skill really needs two days, then you need to adjust it so that kids are, we're, we're absolutely sure that those kids on Tuesday and Wednesday now are getting the skill so that they can move on. But it's really looking, using the data, using the progress monitoring to be sure that you are identifying um, the, 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 the sequence of things and the pacing of things that is working for kids. Not, not um, reducing the rigor at all. I, I don't agree with that at all. I, I, think that, um, I think there's much more to education than, even, than you know, I hate to sound like Charlie Sheen, but you know, there's one speed. <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of things that can happen to keep the rigor there, but to either 
adjust the teaching style or adjust the curriculum so that the rigor is still there, but it's it's more effective than it was before you made the adjustment. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's where that integrity piece comes in. Um, the, when we talked about that, and you saw it during the video, that integrity piece holds clear the standards of the core curriculum piece, which are our common standards. You can't really deviate away from those when you have your instruction. You have to find a way as an instructor to address those standards in such a manner that more children will understand. That's where that PD piece comes in, but the integrity piece was purposely put into RTI to remind people that exactly what your fear is, is that we will be lowering the standards of expectations for our kids in order to reach that percentage point. I think um, always going back to that core curriculum, having that very detailed and prescriptive scope and sequence that is aligned to the common core will keep us very much focused on a higher standard for our kids. But I guess I hear what you're saying is that as long as the assessments confirm that understanding is being achieved, that a 98 and 2 is always a great result. Correct. In this if, if presented. Maintain the fidelity of the curriculum so right. that the rigor yes. is there. Right, yes. I understand. You can come back to me. Oh, I'll come back. We'll come back. Rachel? I actually saw it differently. I, I see it as um, a way for teachers to kind of want to create those numbers to be higher. It, 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 it's a driving force, um, in a sense, for them because that shows a success in, in what they're doing. Quick question. Could, could I add, just add something, because that's such a great point, that just keep in mind that if it's if it's 80% of the kids and we see that there's an increase to 85 and so forth, these kids are fluid. This isn't, okay, 15% of my class goes to tier two and 5% of my class, these five kids out of this class of whatever, you know, go to tier three. It is depending on the skill base, how they're doing with it, what the progress monitoring is saying to us about how those kids are doing that will make the, the actual individuals, the kids, the people, move depending on how they're doing in the class. I, my only question, and, and I don't know if this actually gets incorporated into this program, does it reach to the kids that maybe it's more of a behavioral problem that needs to be intervened at early? that might be causing the learning um, the learning problem for them? Does that, is this kind of incorporated into that? Does they that do have a behavior component, positive behavioral supports. Mm -hmm. We have um, a conflict resolution program that we're working on behaviors. It can be part of RTI. Um, whether or not we decide to focus on that area mm -hmm. or incorporate that or use our existing programs is, is what we'll look at. So kind of an early. We'd really like to stop the world and do it all at one time. I know. The PBIS or positive behavioral interventions and supports is a very similar model, with with multiple layers of interventions for kids as they have behavioral problems. Something that um, you know, as the the programs that exist in the schools now do as well. But that certainly, as we roll this out, I will not be surprised that you know that PBIS or something like PBIS becomes more and more part of that. Yeah, uh, Rhonda? Uh, my question has a lot to do with documentation, of course, and, and the 36 hours of training is great, but how uh, do they provide a model um, by which not only teachers are documenting the instruction, um, but then also how uh, the, um, they're going to be evaluated on the, that instruction or monitored is a better word on that instruction to make sure that the 36 hours is carried throughout the classroom. Um, and if they do, can you talk a little bit about what that, um, that format looks like or that document looks like? I, I, am, I am thinking about um, lesson plans or, you know, Basically, all this teaching is great, but how are you going to guarantee some sort of uniformity across um, the different um, classes? So the first things that come to my mind uh, with the first, first cohort is all the administrators are being trained. So the principal and the assistant principals are going through that training. So once we're trained, we know when we go into the classroom what to look for and to make sure it's being implemented for those teachers that have been trained and now into the rollout. Um, 
we also have the support from Teacher 21 to have the on-site RTI coach. Those people will also be able to go into the classrooms to see what's happening in there and to give additional support to the teacher. So if they're not doing something correctly, they could help with that, um, give feedback right away. So it's an ongoing professional development rather than just training them and just letting them go and, and hope they get it. It's going to be ongoing support from us, from Teachers 21, to make sure that they can maintain what they've learned. Will there be a, um, a directive that there will be upfront planning before the teachers actually go into the classroom and start doing this? So meaning upfront, okay, Monday through Friday, this is what I'm going to teach, this is how I'm going to teach it. I, again, I keep kind of go, going back to lesson plans, like every single day it's, this is, this is how I'm going to do it, and it's documented up front before they even step. I know that it can change throughout the week, but just some sort of plan up front um, before even going into the classroom. Is that part of it? Okay. I think that goes back to that core curriculum and how it is um, aligned with the scope and sequence and the curriculum that we would like to have. We use our curriculum, use research-based interventions that everybody will be using, so it's data-driven as well. When you start to move away from the research-based interventions and core curriculum series and things like that, your success rates go down because all of these things go through a process for acceptability to be used inside the classroom as being proven effective. So that being said, when you go into the classroom, I mean, the teachers will have an arsenal of all of these types of strategies to use. Um, taking something out of your own pocket may be good, but again, we would wanna go through that process <coughs> of ensuring that it does do exactly what the intention is. So your scope and sequence would have, and I'm trying to give you a visual of this, mm -hmm. off of your scope and sequence, if children have difficulty with this standard, with this concept, here are the list of um, prescriptions or the recipes that you may use to intervene, you know, or to prevent the student from um, falling behind. I think also the accountability that I, I think you're looking at comes to a great extent from the data that's collected about student progress at all three tiers, really. How are we doing? Um, is, this, is this a curriculum problem? Is it an instructional problem? If, if the, the charting and the monitoring the students are doing um, tells us that something's not going well in that classroom, then I think the idea of having the RTI coach there to be supportive of that person is the next layer of trying to make instruction in that classroom better. But the, but the bottom line is our instruction needs to be better. And our supports around the use of a very, very structured framework and in the supports of Teachers 21 being there, and these are these are high caliber folks. They they have brought many schools out of very difficult times, um, and and they've done it by both their professional development, very direct, and we saw a lot of pieces of the the work that they do. Um, that the message is we we need to move this instruction forward, and the data will tell us whether that's happening or not. I'd also like to add, um, Rhonda, that scheduling is key in all of this. We worked hard this year on developing a schedule where all grade level teachers have the same planning time together, whereas before that didn't happen. So they do have their planning time that they can meet as a team and go through this. So scheduling is important, the collaboration time is important, so they can use that time to collaborate with each other. Um, and we also built in the actual intervention times, the 30-minute blocks. Right now we have it for ELA and math. We'll still keep it that way, but at least we have it designated so we know exactly when these tiers are going to happen. So it, it is all part of it. I have other questions, but my first yeah. one question. Um, well, you <laughs> get another a lot one. Of time. You That's get okay. another one. You I'll, get two. I'll go back right. around. Jessica? I have two questions. Um, I'm not familiar with the current framework set in place now, so could you just briefly describe what that is and how the RTI is different from that? 
right now, um, teachers are working on teaching children to read. They do it in like an 80 minute block. They have a variety of, of tricks that they use, instruction strategies that they use, but they're doing it themselves. With RTI, they're going to still teach the core curriculum to the children, that's the first layer. But for the children that need extra support, we're now going to bring in our Title I support and our special education teachers to help those children. Right now, it, it happens separately. We have the teachers teaching regular instruction, the special education teachers teaching the children who have been identified on an IEP, and then we have children going out for Title I. So it's all separate. With the RTI model, we're taking all of the staff and combining it all in one to teach all of these children before it even gets to special ed. So we're using the expertise of a lot of professionals to help with these children. Okay. I think the other part of that, Jessica, is the, the targeted part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's not in September there are five children who we think may need help and maybe for three, four, five, six months every third period they go out for extra help. It really is, we taught a specific skill today, what are the, who are the children that are having trouble with that specific skill and giving those students an, an extra dose specific to that skill and through changing, adjusting the instruction to make it more meaningful for them. But the, the really the, the concept <coughs> behind this is that, as I, I think I said it once before, Many children learn, you give them an hour of a new skill and they have mastered it. Some students need 90 minutes to be able to master it and maybe a little adjustment in how it's presented. And they say, aha, I have it. Then there's another five, three, five percent that say, no, that didn't do it for me either. I, I need something more than that. And, but they get it and I think that's the difference. In, the, in what I would call the binary system since 1974, has been, there's classroom instruction, and yes, there's support of Title I and, and, and other supports in place, but it was primarily, primarily regular education and special education. And as the Director of the Bureau of Special Education in Pennsylvania said in the video, this is a new way of thinking. This is about special education and regular education working together because it's education. And, and that's really what RTI tries to accomplish and, and has accomplished and, and I haven't talked about this at all but there are, I mentioned I think to Jeff earlier that I did my training in RTI probably, I'm gonna say about eight years ago, it may have been a little less than that. And the state of Georgia adopted the RTI model across the state. Every, every um, school in Georgia needed to have an RTI model <coughs> their percentages of children who required special education services was 17, 18, 19 percent of the kids. One out of five, one out of six of the, of the children. With this model, because there was so much intensive intervention within the regular education framework, those numbers dropped to around seven percent and even six percent, which meant that those teachers, those special education teachers were able to give more immediate instruction to children who had not been identified yet as special education, but they, they got it today. You know, they got the help today. And, and that's a very important part of it, I think. Thank okay. you, Jeff. Another and, question? Um, I have one more question. How will you be assessing whether the student understands it or not? As we know that sometimes a student won't admit that they are having as trouble with a certain area smart. in a subject than others. Great question. There's one assessment we use, it's called Dibbles, and if you saw in the video, one of the teachers said, we'll be dibbling. Mm -hmm. So that's an assessment that's done three times um, throughout the year, and the teachers have a quick view of how the students are doing and how they're learning, and they use that data. It can tell them if they can read fluently, if they can read nonsense words, um, things like that. Progress monitoring is what we're going to be using to very frequently assess these children as they're going through the tiers to see actually if they are making the gains that we want them to see. So we have some formal testing, we have some informal testing. In the reading series, we have um, assessments that we do as well. That gives the teacher data. They're constantly doing um, observations of children and they have their own checklists and they have running records. 
So there's a variety of assessments that we'll be using to look to see how the students are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. A um, couple of questions uh, that I have. Um, first of all, um, believe it or not, I'm as excited about this as you are, Bob. I, I think that this is, uh, and I don't even want to use it as strategy because it's not. It's practice. Uh, and for the first time, I think that the practice, the practice clearly focuses on learning. Um, and, uh, and that's refreshing to me. But I do have some concerns, obviously. Um, I just envision, and I haven't seen it in practice, and I haven't gone through the training, and I'm not fluent in uh, RTI by any stretch of the imagination. We're going to do a tier two intervention on you. <laughs> on me. You have to do it on me. But anyways, the, the thing that bothers me is, just like everything else, it was just like uh, differentiated instruction, which, the, which, this is, which is a part of this. Ballpark, and I know you don't have any basis for this. I, I, I find it very difficult to think that the teacher's work plate is going to remain the same. It's either going to be plus or minus. In your estimation, is it going to be plus or minus? And if so, how much? I, I, my very honest answer to you is that I think that in the transition phase of this, there is more work. In the transition phase of this, we need to do some things to be able to support them. And, and that is on my charts in terms of how we're going to be able to support them both through Title I and through special education. But clearly, there is more work to be done short term. And that's why I think the first or second slide I said both looking at funding both transitionally and long term. If you look at if you look at the, I'll give you the one I know. If you look at the state of Georgia that in three years went from a special education population of about, I'm going to say 17 to 18 percent, and that dropped to about 7 percent, there, there was a need for reallocation. Nobody's losing their job here. This is a reallocation of resources. So, and I've been in special education since 1975. Teachers spend tremendous amounts of time, tremendous amounts of time, special education teachers, evaluating, meeting, writing progress reports, writing IEPs. Not, not that those are bad things, I don't mean that. And they're necessary for some children. But, but as since 1975 to 2011, if we charted the amount of time that those people who go through a tremendous amount of education to be able to become a special education teacher, the amount of time that they spend with students teaching has gone down and down and down and down and down. So I think that as, as the, the focus shifts to intervening immediately, before we talk about special education, before we say this child needs specialized instruction that's not available as part of our regular education framework, that's the phrase that I hold on to. If we are a multi-tiered instruction model, and I've got a child struggling in third grade in phonics, I have three tiers of instruction for them to be able to get through, to be able to learn that, before somebody says, you know what, we really need to evaluate them. No, I understand all that. I, so, I, I, I really do. I, I, well, so I'm sorry. I, I got off track. So my answer to your question is in terms of things being on, more being on people's plate. As the shift happens, I, I believe that that will settle down. I, in fact, I think that our presenter supported that, that, that that balance does come back. But this is new. It, it is new to people. In it's not new. The, the concepts are, are very common sense concepts are, are, are not new at all. It's what we know, the best things right. we know about how kids learn. So it's a matter of making that transition. Transitions by the quote experts is about a three year transition. You heard that after one year, they saw this progress and that progress. And I agree, I can't remember whether it was Chris or, or Joan that said it, that I think it was Joan, that they learned this. We, we've targeted our choice, target ELA, Learn it well, do it well. Don't try to do it all at one time, but do it swiftly. I mean, you can see the, the, the pace that we have is quite fast. 
but you but you do it well and with ELA, you're not ignoring math. We have many things in place for math. But certainly the concept is much easier in math because you've done it for ELA. No, I, I mean, um, obviously, if, if you've got uh, mastery of our language uh, and good reading skills, you're, you're, you're going to do better in math. Uh, I believe that. Uh, but the reason I ask the question is because um, in order for this thing, thing to succeed, And I'm not talking about the training. I'm talking about beyond the training. Mm -hmm. It's got to be done right. Mm -hmm. If it's not done right, it's not going to work. Right. Uh, many of my colleagues um, throughout the, my work um, as an independent consultant, you know, has, have got mixed feelings about inclusion. Many of them don't feel that inclusion has worked the way it was intended to work. Um, and primarily is because the rollout was okay, but it just wasn't done right in e each individual classroom. Um, so that's the thing that kind of scares me a little bit. And if, if what I walk through those elementary classrooms and these teachers are working really hard. And um, that, that's the risk. And I, 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 I think you can appreciate it. Um, and to, to put another thing on them. The other, the other thing, the other question I have is the, um, we're using our resources, and I know what you have to do, and I know we need professional development, and I know Teachers 21 has got a, a grand reputation, um, but you know, we're using a lot of those resources that we're going to go directly to direct services to kids, out reallocating that into PD. Do you find that risky? Can, <clears throat> can, can I um, respond? As part of the RTT grant, it was very prescriptive where we needed to spend the money. And again, as we've said at this table many times, grant money is one-time money. So I think it's entirely appropriate that we use it for training purposes rather than staffing for children no, because I don't it won't be here afterwards. Right. The, the other thing that I feel compelled, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to elongate the conversation. Well, you're asking my question, so it's a question. Um, but I believe you are absolutely correct. Our teachers do work very hard, but there's a way to work smarter, and that's where the training comes. And beyond the difference between other times that we've rolled out things, we've rolled it out, we've had the training, and then the teachers go in the classroom and close the door. The difference here, at the same time, we are talking about enhanced supervision to have additional eyes going into classrooms to make sure that people are using the training and that they get the help they need either through one of our own supervisors and or the coach, coach. from, from um, Teachers 21. So it is different. Um, and I think we're all excited. We know oh, I'm very excited. We, we know that um, it isn't going to be easy, that it's going to be hard work, and that's why the rollout and bringing people in gradually, uh, but I think in the long run it will bear fruit. Great. Jeff? I get two more, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep going all night. I don't care. Go ahead. You just got to put a period in the um, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm, I miss Kenny. Yeah, exactly. Please, I'm sorry. Kenny. I'm all set because no. I, I had a question on training that, that Joan answered. You sure? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm making notes going forward. Okay. I'm sorry. Jeff? I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to defend the decision to go with ELA as opposed to math. The data says that more than half of the kids, students in Wareham School District, are not proficient in math. And that number drops to about uh, a third are, are not proficient in ELA. So we, and if we are in restructuring, for example, from a NCLB perspective, it's usually because of math. So it just jumps out that math is the problem. Now, obviously, it would be, I'm not saying that literacy isn't critical to everything. But nevertheless, there's a glaring problem in the school district with regard to math, and yet you've chosen to do it second instead of first. 
So I'm sure there's a great reason, so I'd love to hear it. Um, I would start by saying you can't read a math problem if you, have a, if you can't read. Math is, is not only just computation, a lot of it is problem solving. You have to have the strategies to be able to read and problem solve. So we have to start with the ELA portion of it. Um, our students need the support from, from the reading um, perspective. And I know we need to focus on math as well, but I feel strongly we have to start with reading. Um, we're not there yet across the board with our ELA. We have pockets of, of children that we really need to work on um, strengthening their reading skills. And then once we can get that in place, then we can look, and, and we're working on math still. I mean, we have a great everyday math program now, and we're seeing great you know, results from that. But I feel really strongly that we have to start with ELA. I think there are, there are a couple of things that, you know, that we look at when we look at the MCAS scores and making AYP and everything, that is exactly what the data shows in math. But math is a developmental skill, okay? It depends on the child's maturity, and it is easier to go back, okay, and recuperate in mathematics than it is oh, in reading. Those skills that we look at, you know, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, all those five things that we look at when we talk about reading, you know, there's a window of time for children to be able to grasp those skills and really utilize them. They say that in the early years you learn to read and then later on you read to learn. So that being said, we have to, we have to give that window and that tool as quickly as we can and make sure that it's solid. Mathematics, we can recoup that. And, and we can see by the, the high school scores that it is recouped. We don't have 50% failure at the high school. Um, it's developmental and the child's ability to accept that mathematics given their brain development at that particular time and that particular day, you know, it varies. Some kids start school a year early. Some kids start school a year late. Well, that all matters when you're talking about mathematics. Second question. How dynamic, how fluid is this 80 15, 5. And by that I mean if you're part, if you're a student who's in second tier um, in October, um, are you likely to be in second tier in February? Or is this, or is the presumption that over the course of the year that 80 is going to shrink closer to 90, et cetera? So how dynamic is it? Uh, are the students that are in these second, third, and first tiers? I would love for, for every um, person to, to absolutely believe, just because they want to trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to trust you, Bob. That it should be very, very fluid. Now, does that mean that you know, student A may find himself multiple times in tier two? Absolutely. But the idea of this is my tier two group, this is my tier three group, these five individuals, these three individuals are my tier two and my tier three group needs to go away. And the difference is my tier two group should be the five kids who had trouble on what I did today. And Johnny may or may not be part of that group. And in fact, Johnny's ability to not always be part of that group is a good thing. But the idea is that the, the, the tiers are connected. And if this, if this is the concept, and these happen to be the five people today that need a second dose of it, then these should be the five people. Not because they're the bluebirds, but because they're the five who don't understand the OA sign, whoever they are. That's that, a key concept, though. Yes, and that's exactly the answer I wanted to hear. I thought so. But what I really, but what I really want to know is what does the data say? Because this is not new. But it's all about what the data says and, to make yeah. that happen. And does the, that's, that's, does the data say that it, it is fluid? Right. Yes. And Johnny yes. Can, yes. Yeah. yes, it's fluid right now. We and do it now. We do it now in Title in One. Now. That's right. Okay. We have Title One where um, we have children going out for Tier Three, 
and the interventionist is progress monitoring those students. So at the end of a six week period, some of those children are coming out of the tier three group and they may be going back into the tier two group. Or if you have a student that's in tier two and it was a skill that they were struggling on, maybe they're going into the tier three group. So we're doing that now, progress monitoring, the children are moving in and out of their tiers, back, you know, back to tier one. Um, and the teachers are used to the tiers, which RTI talks about, so it's not something new, and I know you're concerned about are we adding more onto their plate. They're already used to doing part of this. So they've had some instruction and some training on that, so it isn't something new. It's now taking all the pieces and putting it all together. Just the staffing is the part that we haven't had um, in collaboration. It's been done in isolation. So this is the new piece that I'm looking forward to. Because presently in the elementary schools, approximately once a month, we give benchmark exams using specific skills, looking for those skills that we have just taught the previous month. And although they're being informally assessed during you know, that month, so if, that if a child is beginning to fall behind or let's just say a child is absent for a week, that's an immediate, okay, we know what we need to do here. This is a, a learning gap. So we take that child and give that child the extra support there. But for the most part, those groups are very fluid and they do change approximately every month or every six weeks. But they also can change within a week, given the fact that, like I just said, if, if a child is absent for a week and then needs to go back and get those skills. Um, that's all the data collection that we've been experimenting with this year. Um, in both math and ELA, those benchmark assessments have been taking place and those groups have been moving around. And it is interesting to, to see it. So I would just, um, hopefully you've gotten some concept of some of the language of RTI. I would encourage you to look at the teachers21.org website uh, as, a, as a very good website to kind of get an idea of some of the success stories. Um, I think that we want to be able to have people understanding the concepts and, um, and, I, and so I hope that you've gotten some of that. Rachel, another question? No, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no. It's okay. I only uh, got two anyway. Rhonda, another question? <laughs> I do, I just have two more. <laughs> sorry, just real quick. I tried to close it, Rhonda. I know you I did. did. <laughs> These are quick. Nice try, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make an appointment four or five hours tomorrow, okay, with you? <laughs> and I can get all my questions. You know, I'm selling, that's what they They're a lot us. quicker here Assume than clothes. when I come to your office. Um, the universal screening tool, is that a tool that currently exists today? And if not, are you if not, are you creating your own and will it be different class by class? Just the universal screening tool, is that we have several. We have okay. the um, the pretest at the beginning of the year. It's called G Made for Mathematics, which is a diagnostic tool and it's standardized, and the, G, and the grade, grade, which is the reading version of it. Also a diagnostic tool, also standardized. We do that at the beginning of the year at both schools, and we do it at the end of the year. And then, as Ms. Siemens had said, we do the dibbles throughout the year, and then our new um, math curriculum comes with um, benchmark exams that are very skill specific and a little checklist so that you can see up and down, you know, where this child is in these particular skills and where the area of mastery is or weakness and, and things yeah, like that. I just didn't know if RTI, that they came out with a new, something new that, but we'll just be using our existing screening tools. Mm -hmm. They okay. had several recommendations in the presentations that we were at and among them were the ones that we Were the ones that we're already Absolutely. using. Yes. Okay, great. And then the only other um, question that I had is, um, the um, smart goals that you have, is there any way that we could get a copy full of those? Copy? The full copy? Sure. Yeah. Just, it was they're, hard to read on here. Honestly still in, and the reason is that because, as, as you know, uh, one of them are measures of progress, and I wanted to be able to work with Teachers 21 to help identify how we're going to define progress. So they, so they really are incomplete. I mean, uh, okay. but I. Because I think that some of the other questions that I have, again, just more around, you know, right setting the right you know expectations everyone knows exactly what they need right. to do and how you're going to monitor that I think that will probably go into you know a lot of those questions will be answered once I see how you're going to right. measure and, and, the actions and the part. measurement part of it is going to be multi-layered because how effectively people are scheduling for example yeah. will be very different than how, how effectively people are collaborating with title one special ed people 
how, how effectively people are sh kind of shifting to looking at targeted needs for kids um, and so forth. So, so I, we just, that part of it I felt was quite important to make sure that we hit all the pieces um, before we say, okay, here's what, how we're gonna decide whether it's working or it's not working. With the success of RTI, there's no additional funding uh, source or opportunities out there yet? Any grants or? Um, actually, we have, I mean, certainly RTTT is very had said. Um, we're also going to use a portion of what's called early intervening in the 94-142 grant. And, and this has got to be progressive because as the num number, our anticipated numbers of special needs children reduce, then we can use more of those funds. But uh, two years ago, they allowed us to use early intervening money out of the special education grant. The One of the articles that I read said that the the formula, um, how people are paying for this, is that they're combining multiple grants and, and com, you know state, federal, special right. ed. They're pulling them all together and, and using them. I just didn't know if now there is um, some you know no very godmother RTT. that are going to come down and say RTI is the way to go. Here's Certainly a bulk there are of some money to roll it out. competitive grants that are encouraging early intervening um, and. We will look at those as well. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jessica, anything else? No, I'm good. Okay. Rachel, what's that? Kenny? Okay. Was it teachers21.org, Bob? Teachers21.org. We've also used them in other literacy areas. It's so that one, Kim, the numerical. It's not, um, they're not a new agency to us. Um, they've been working on the six plus one traits, they've done training with. Um, some of our, our teachers at the grade levels, and um, they, we've had some positive feedback from them. That's a very, very big operation. It's a very big operation. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, again, well, another question. Go only, ahead. One, only one this time. Go ahead. <laughs> I share my colleagues' excitement for for what you're about to do. I really do. But I have to ask this question. I hate the idea that Georgia is leading Massachusetts. <laughs> I want to know. Do you feel better about Arkansas? <laughs> no, I would not. So I want to know why, if you if you left Georgia, sold on this program, why are we doing this now? Why didn't we do this two years ago, three years ago? What what's why is this something that we are doing now? RTI money. We have the money through the RTTT grant. Right that's allowing us to have the training and that we can now look at the resources in order to do it. I'm sorry, we've got a 20, 30 million plus grant budget and the amount of money you put up there is a rounding error with respect to funding this program. I'm not saying it's in absolute dollars an irrelevant sum, but when you're talking about a budget of 30 plus million dollars when you include everything and you're talking about an entire the beginnings of the education of over 3,000 children, what am I missing? I why, are we, why are we just doing this now? Many districts, not just us. I know that. Um, it's, it's more but, of but an- But you're the district we're responsible for. It's, it's, it's an investment piece, and as in any investment piece, it's really kind of hard to um, take this monster on and master it. Did you say monster? Yes because it is widespread. You're, you're looking to change an entire culture of a community, mm -hmm. basically, and the way people teach and, and the way kids mm -hmm. learn and the way administrators administer. Mm -hmm. Everything changes. You have a good, stable background, but you have to be open to what needs to be done in order to move forward, and that focus can never be taken away. So when you look at what um, Dr. Sylvia had said, well, how can this be? It's got to be more work. Well, it is. It's more work, but it's more refined work. Um, and I think you get better results with that refined work. So you can either do what Dr. Benevich said, you can work smarter, you, you know, or you can work very hard for long periods of time. That's a big undertaking for any district to take, and you have to be willing to take your time to see some results, use, keep on using money even though you don't see that quick fix, and really invest in, in, in your faculty and in your team. And not everybody is willing to do that. We're very fortunate in Wayham that we have leaders that do believe in us, and that is one of the first things that they look for, is that you must have um, administration um, buy-in to this and leadership to, to sail you along. How confident and are it, you in success, Dr. Very, <laughs> very. And as I said before, it's this is not a new thing, and we're not, we're not just now jumping on the bandwagon. We've been doing tiered instruction. 
So we now have the resources to expand that, getting all of our staff together, getting the training that we want. 36 hours of training is huge for staff members. And we can now do that. Very exciting. Uh, elements of this that we, you know, elements of our, again, I'm not an expert on this at all. Uh, response with, uh, into, uh, oh God, I can't think straight. Response well, to intervention. intervention. And I'm not an expert by any stretch of nature. You guys have probably forgotten more about it than I'll know. But I do know this, that certain elements of it, we're already doing, all right? We're already doing differentiation. We're already, we're already using data to, to uh, um, uh, recognize um, things. So some of that stuff, but the big thing is, and you know, and to, to maybe answer Jeff's, we're putting the pressure on you guys. We're saying, hey, we want to close the achievement gap. You know, we want, we're want we sick of the, we're sick of all the strategies and, and, and putting it on curriculum alignment and all this kind of stuff. No, we want some results. Mm -hmm. And so I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons why is because we're putting the pressure on. Not, not, not to say that, you know, you're doing it because of us, but I think that we're an element out oh, there that's saying, you know, <laughs> you know, we're an element out there that's saying, hey, we want some results here. You know, we've got $30 million. We want to see, you know, we want to see that gap between state average and the achievement of our kids across grade level shrink. Okay. And you know what? We're putting the ball in your court now. And that's why I'm saying it's risky. <laughs> so, I think, I think the our kids slide, deserve it. The second slide in the presentation was RTI is not, and the very first thing was new. It is not new. Um, many of these things have been worked on for a very long time. Many of the things have taken some planning, even in what we present to you tonight. Um, I remember Dr. Rabinovich saying to me two years ago in a school committee meeting when you unanimously voted for the West Virginia Academy, he said, okay, here's the saw, <laughs> here's the branch. Yeah. Um, before there was a saw in the branch. Uh, Tree's still know, standing though, isn't it? Uh, Tree's still, I'm still standing. Yeah. <laughs> so it took some yeah. Any other questions? Let's wrap this up. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank again. You. Um, Joan, Chris, thank you for coming in. Bob, again, thank you for your time. I know it's been a, a long night. Uh, I want to thank the committee for insightful questions. Uh, and uh, Mr. Palladino, you have Come on down. You have three minutes. That works for Scott. <laughs> Broccoli stays frozen and the freeze up and the ice cream disappears. You want me to turn off the audio? You want to share your kitchen set with the whole world? They're live, folks. Thank you, Kirsten, for the reminder. It's the home, cook, home cooking network. It was only one invoice compared to the other. I'm sure there were many uh, vegetable invoices. Well, this is the, uh, oh, is this yeah. been revised? Uh, maybe just a couple pages, pages of it, but I'm going to give you a revised version. Just okay. go again. Bob, send it to me anyway, okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. Well, Mr. Lazar's helping me out with the technical. Is this uh, improved? Okay. Well, it, I, I'm not sure which one you have. And there may be some page numbers that would change. I don't think there's anything drastic, but I'm going to use that as a guideline for our presentation tonight. Does everybody have While we're page? setting up the technology, I'm just going to give you a some information on how we got to this point today. Um, we started off uh, very early in the uh, latter part of the fall uh, meeting with our department heads 
uh, to talk about their needs in the departments. Uh, they then went back and, and spoke to the teachers. They then went back and spoke with the teachers. We came back, Debbie and myself, and we met with the department heads individually. We then uh, met with Jan Rotella, the curriculum director. Uh, we then met with the curriculum subcommittee, and uh, here we are today. I'm gonna start off with our PowerPoint um, momentarily, but I just want to uh, briefly summarize uh, the program of studies that uh, I believe is uh, covering around 43 pages. So hopefully, rather than have you go through all 43 pages, I can give you a, a shorter version. But basically, uh, because of our uh, No Child Left Behind standing, the class of 2014 is gonna be required uh, to abide by uh, the Mass Corps. Uh, basically, there are some things uh, in, our, in our core areas that are not gonna change. We're already meeting that requirement, but there are a few areas that will change. Uh, in the English language arts, currently, we require four units, and uh, the Mass Corps also requires four units. The mathematics, currently, we require three units, Although a third of our students that are EPP based on their, uh, they have a proficiency plan based on their math MCAS scores are required to have a fourth year of math. But as part of the math core, everyone will have four years of math. Science, currently our requirement is two years of a lab-based science. The requirement under math core is three years. And in history and social studies, they require uh, three units, and we require three units, and uh, their requirement is one has to be U.S. and one has to be world. Our requirement is world, U.S. history one, and U.S. history two. Foreign language, it is not a requirement currently to graduate from Wareham High School, but it is advised that they take two years of a foreign language. Under the Mass Corps, they'd be required to take uh, two units of a foreign language. Physical education, Currently, it's required for four units, and the mass score says whatever is the state law is what, is, what, what you have to have, which obviously is the four years. In the arts, uh, right now we require a half a unit. Uh, mass core would require one unit. Okay. Okay. Um, additional core courses, such as business, technology, health uh, and technical courses would be, uh, right now we require four and a half units, Mass Core requires five. There is a, a page for additional learning opportunities. Uh, basically, we do not require them, neither does the Mass Core, but it is encouraged under the Mass Core. Those would be uh, your AP courses, your dual enrollment, and uh, online courses that we're hoping to get started for next year. Some of the changes that I'll go through in the, uh, in the fine arts, and now we can kind of go through and, and take a look at the uh, cheat sheet that I, I did send you a revised one, which I think will represent uh, the pages a bit more accurately. But in the fine arts department, um, we're looking to uh, incorporate uh, and try and come on a cycle where it's every other year we're offering some electives. We're, our electives are down because of some cuts last year, and we're hoping to create uh, maybe an odd even fiscal year rotation where at least at one point in time uh, during their upperclassmen years they'd have an opportunity to take some of these electives. Uh, the new art course is uh, ni 912, which is uh, food and art. Um, and if you need further explanations, I'll, I'll be glad to give those to you. There is a course uh, 913, which is 3D, 3D design, it's wearable art. Uh, and there's also uh, a change in Adobe Photoshop because we are trying to run an Adobe Photoshop 2 class. So that's something new for us uh, this year. So that's in the art. Uh, do you want me to just do the presentation and then um, kind of go through and answer questions afterwards, stop with each department? What's no, your pleasure we'll on that? Thing. Go through, go the, through whole the whole thing? thing? Yeah. Okay. The foreign language, um, what we're proposing to do is with foreign language, the only change would be 
for incoming freshmen that have not scored a passing score in uh, ELA science or MCAS, they will not enroll in foreign languages freshmen. They will enroll in the, either their sophomore and or junior and senior year. They would be uh, enrolled in some remediation type classes uh, that we currently offer. All right, go ahead. Moving on to phys <coughs> physical education. Um, basically, in phys ed, what we're looking to do with the upperclassmen, because there is a four-year requirement, is to incorporate some elective courses that would uh, constitute their physical ed education classes. Currently, in grades 9 and 10, um, they get a broad spectrum of different types of uh, physical education programs, activities. And basically what would happen in the upperclassmen, they'd have an opportunity uh, to be involved in activities such as new games, uh, lifetime fitness activities. Uh, there could be some uh, uh, net games, they call them, all different types of uh, activities, non-traditional in nature. And they would have the, uh, an opportunity to select that. There's a science of athletic conditioning as well that's incorporated in the, in the physical education. Uh, last year and this year, it was offered to students in grades 10 through 12, uh, but because of the elective option that we're looking to have for the upperclassmen, it will only be uh, available for 11th and 12th graders. <coughs> in the business and technology department, uh, there are some courses we have not offered for years, and I want this to be, a, um, this program of studies to be reflective of what's being offered or what we hope to offer and not what we've offered 10 years ago. Um, so we removed uh, small engines, metals fabrication, personal financial management, web ventures one and two, construction carpentry, personal com uh, consumer finance, computer keyboards, and super right. The personal financial management and consumer finance actually was taken out of the business department, but it has to be taught by someone who's uh, a certified math teacher, and you'll see that in the math department. That makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, we also added a clause to the school to career if a student has a chronic attendance problem, we uh, have the right at the halfway point to move him or her into a different class, which would be an elective class, in hopes of salvaging some credit for the second semester. This would be done at the end of January. We have a new course. It's going to be tied in with our Woodworking Tech 3. It's a Tech 4 class for students that are uh, very involved in the wood shop and want to take a senior year of, of and this would be uh, some of your larger projects, and possibly either some community service projects that you would see. Um, so while it's not necessarily a new, uh, it's going to be a combined class, but there'll be a new section, if you will. Uh, English, uh, we have in the English department, we, I'm going to just kind of talk about a prerequisite that you're going to see multiple times. The prerequisite um, is in regards to honors, classes for freshmen, Basically, I'm just going to give you this, the synopsis of that. Um, we are requiring um, that students that are coming in to our honors program, whether it be English 9 honors, whether it be a math honors as a freshman, they're coming in, uh, we're going to require a couple things. Uh, the first thing is they're going to have to have a recommendation from their eighth grade teacher. I think that has been consistent throughout the years. But there are also uh, a couple of other prerequisites. They have to have uh, advanced standing, and in this case in English, in the ELA portion of their MCAS, uh, above proficient score on the English 9 honors placement test, and as I mentioned, the recommendation. We're going to allow if they have two out of three of those for them to be uh, processed into the, uh, in this case, English 9. Uh, the English 10 honors, uh, there is a requirement for a student to get into the English 10 honors, which is the uh, 126. Also, we have universal language for AP uh, classes. Basically, just to paraphrase, if the student is enrolling in the AP course, they must take the AP exam and they must pay for the AP exam. So that is just, uh, we want to make sure that's very clear to everyone as, as they enter into the AP courses. And you'll see that in a few other departments as well. Um, there is a course description for the SAT prep. Um, uh, basically, it's encouraged for juniors to take the course. It was in the course of studies for many years. I, I don't think it's been offered more than one time in the last 10 years, but we're really hoping to be able to offer that next year. Uh, there's a change um, in the contemporary writers, which is actually on page 31, and we have removed uh, the film study honors class, uh, which hasn't run in a few years. Um, and again, as I mentioned, SAT prep, they're encouraged 
uh, to take that starting with the junior class for next year. Moving on to the history department, uh, there is a change, uh, as I mentioned, with the AP courses, and this just has to do with uh, they must take the test and pay, and, and that will be a common theme for a few of the departments. Um, we removed the course 251, which is history and film. We haven't been able to run that based on staffing issues. And uh, our department head has a plan for psychology. He would like to run next school year, um, a year and a half from now, he'd like to run an AP psychology course. So he has taken uh, the full year course and is gonna run it as a semesterized course in the hopes of getting more students uh, involved in psychology and excited about the field of psychology. Um, we've had some wonderful psychology teachers and we continue to have good psychology teachers here at the school. And uh, there are a lot of kids that graduate and go on to psych majors. So we're excited about being able to offer that at the AP level. Uh, there's a small description change in AP economics. Um, and some uh, prerequisites based on um, the change is basically that, again, they have to pay for that. And there's a change to the constitutional law honors on page 34, a small change. Uh, moving on, <coughs> excuse me, to the science department. Uh, we're hoping to, again, stay with that theme where we can't, we don't have uh, the enrollment to be offering certain electives every year, but we're going to try and get on a basis where we're rotating some new ones in taking out some old ones, just giving some students an opportunity uh, to get excited about some of their electives. Uh, the environmental science is new. We have run it in the past, but it's, it's new to the course of studies this year. Uh, the engineering science, um, and so those are new. The, the AP uh, description, as we talked about in the other departments, uh, there is a new course, core science. These would be uh, for students that are identified to have some deficiencies in their 10th grade science MCAS. This would be an 11th grade course. Um, and there's a new course, uh, Forensic Science, which uh, the kids uh, in the past, uh, when it was, when we did run it two years ago, were very excited. I think there were some CSI fans that were uh, <laughs> excited about that. In the math department, um, prerequisite for geometry honors, uh, to, to get into the geometry honors, the 420. There's also uh, the 420 core, 420B, which is a core math. There's some changes in the language there. As we mentioned, the AP language that's universal. And we put this, even though it's going to be a, a term of math and a term of English, I wanted to put the uh, SAT prep in, in both the math and the English department because there will be a certified English teacher and a certified math teacher um, that c would s sort of co-teach it, but basically they'd have the kids for a term and another, uh, the English teacher would have the kids for a term as well, and they may do some cooperative uh, learning as well. The social studies department is responsible for the JROTC program. Uh, for four years, um, it is, they have offered for students that are in the uh, LET program to receive physical education credits because it is a year-long course and roughly half of it has uh, a physical aspect to it. So four years ago, uh, they, they agreed, it was agreed that they would uh, offer uh, one semester of physical education credit for the LET courses. And again, those are year-long. That basically uh, breaks down uh, the changes. Um, I think at this point I'm going to pause in the presentation and, and, and ask if there are any questions. Okay, we'll start on this side. Okay. And I said this in the very beginning, and I'm sorry if I didn't hear it. Um, when deciding on uh, classes that are no longer going to be offered, as well as new classes that are put on, um, the um, was there a level of um, student input into that process? Yes, thank you. And, and that's the second part of my presentation. Basically, upon approval today, um, the course selection will begin next week. And basically, some of these courses that I'm presenting to you tonight and some of the courses in here, when we're talking obviously electives, may not run this year based on student interest. We want to be in this, obviously you have to have staffing, so there may be a lot of student interest, and they may not be able to staff the position for that for that one class, but we're going to let this uh, the electives be driven by a student, um, so basically by the signups. But even before this was put together, before the decisions were made, was there student input into hey, here's what we're thinking? Right. You know, there was there was not a lot of interest in this, and were they part of the whole entire process to even get to these recommendations? 
um, the, when the teachers brought it back, um, there was some conversation. I'm not sure to what extent. Um, the teachers brought it back to their classes, had some conversation. Again, I'm not sure to what extent that, uh, there, but there was some involvement, yes. And then the only other question I had is you, you made a comment about the student attendance and that if their attendance is poor, then they would be moved to, <coughs> was that the, um, the career? School to career. School to career. And where would they be moved to if, if they're having an issue and, and you need to take them out of that? Right. If um, they've missed too many courses to receive credit for the year, rather than allow them to spin the tires and, and us to hold a spot in, in one of our uh, school to career locations, we would then at the semester, which at the end of the halfway point, the end of January, we would put them in two elective courses versus the school to career. Okay. They could attain five credits versus zero. So it's in, in hopes of rekindling that, um, the excitement about coming to school every day. Okay, thanks. Yes. Ken? Just so, so you know, I do have questions, but Rhonda continues to ask my questions. Telepathy. <laughs> Sorry, go to Kenny first from now on. Don't want to hear that. No, that's a good thing. <laughs> They're thinking alike because I did have a question on the attendance, so thank you for, for answering it. And the other thing, Scott, you mentioned I missed something when you're talking about incoming freshmen can't enroll until the sophomore. Can you go back to that? Foreign uh, the language. foreign language. Right. Okay. Yeah. If if a student, because we only have so many periods in the in the day, if a student has some identified deficiencies, uh, we want to put them. We want to intervene and, and put them in uh, a re remedial class to give them the help that they need to be successful in the tenth grade MCAS. For instance, if there's a identifiable deficiency in math, we would then put them in a core math class to help them um, to basically to catch up. I mean, you know, we're working on establishing that foundation and getting them to where they need to be. And they would still have the opportunity, though, just so we're clear. We're not taking away opportunities. It is a requirement for them to take two years of a foreign language. It just doesn't have to be freshman and sophomore year. Am I missing something on the removing physical education and 11 and 12, you're talking about four points. Uh, Sorry, four points? On, four? on physical education. <coughs> Can you give me a little explanation? Right, basically there's a, there's a right. general curriculum that's followed for physical education. It involves many different activities. Okay. What we're looking to do is channel that curriculum to areas of interest. For instance, there's a sports and science uh, class that, that's run. Um, a, a lot of kids that are involved in the athletics like to do that. That is an elective phys ed that they could take in either the 11th or 12th. There's a new games activity, which is a really cool uh, unit. I had a chance to observe a teacher in it just the other day. And, and what it really does is it, it levels the playing field because, so to speak, because it's non-traditional. So it was interesting to see some, some of your better athletes uh, are on a level playing field with some of your non-athletes in the class. So it's a it's an opportunity for students to be selective with their physical education class and, and hopefully garnish some excitement uh, in the last two years of their high school career. Okay. But they still have to take the same number of classes. So that, that hasn't correct? changed. Okay. That's, the that's only thing that's changed is that their junior and senior year, uh, upon successfully completing the first two years of phys ed, freshman, uh, freshman phys ed and sophomore phys ed, they then can kind of choose the pathway that they're going to go for the other two phys ed classes. It doesn't excuse it. It's yeah. a four-year requirement. Well, thanks for that clarification. That's why I thought they were missing out on the, uh, the classes. No, not at all. Um, I'll go. The, um, well, now that we're talking about phys ed, just so everyone knows, uh, Mr. Palladino did meet with the curriculum subcommittee, and we did go over some of these issues uh, prior to this meeting. And uh, I, I can honestly say that Mr. Palladino uh, took some of our recommendations or suggestions and has gone back and reworked it. So I appreciate uh, his input, his listening to our input. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be me if I didn't stay with I'm my ready. pet peeve. <laughs> I still am. You know, the school committee has control of what is taught in our school, the school system, but not how we teach it right. or how long we teach it. Just what is taught. Um, so we really have no control over this. But we're still offering, no matter how you slice the cake, 12 and a half hours in phys ed, 12 and a half credits in phys ed. And if you If you count health. Correct. 
the state requirement says 10 credits. Right. Okay. I still have a problem with that. And I'm just, just for saying it for the record. I just, I'm just saying it for the record. We, we should be doing what the state requires, 10 credits of health and phys ed, and use those other 2.5 for experiential education. That's all I'm saying. Because I, I could beat a dead horse to death. But for the record, I want it out there again. Um, you've explained the foreign language, and I, I'm glad that, that that what you've done with foreign language makes sense to me. Because if, if they're deficient, in one of the areas on MCAS, obviously, uh, they're in line for some kind of support. So, uh, you know, that, that just makes sense to me. Um, what didn't make sense to me was any kind of a, a special language class. So that, that's, that's very, very, very good. I, I really appreciate that. Um, again, a, f a full course of Adobe Photoshop, you know, all, all power to them. And I know they're creative, but, well, I'll tell you, I'm a technical idiot, and I can... I just don't know how they're going to frame a course in Adobe for an entire course. So I know they can do other things with it, and I know they can, they can, they can. Yeah. They can it's a lot. Very, very well, I, I hope so. I went into the class because I knew this question was. I hope so. No, I hope so. And it I really was do. amazing to me what they can do with digital editing and, and how in depth that can go. Good, uh, because I, I, I was. You know, I would hate to think it'd be regurgitation of the same thing day in and day out. Mm -hmm. It's quite intense what they can okay. do. So I, I was, I went in and up based then upon I'm our, our previous conversation. Okay, then I'm satisfied. Personal finance and management. Yes. Now you know I have a bias. Yes, I do. Okay, <laughs> and my bias is very, very clear because it just seems to me. Well, first of all, is Mass Core is Mass Core requiring it? The person, uh, not requiring it. Okay. No. Well, it just seems to me. To, in, in my estimation, kind of ridiculous to use up a math teacher to teach this course. When we really need to concentrate on math skills. So that being said, you know, a name of a course is a name of a course is a name of a course. So uh, I still think it belongs in business technology, but that's but, another story. But you know, it's been in, and I'm not saying what's done in the past is right, but it's been in the math because. Oh, of I know, I know, issue. I know. But you know, that's that's just my bias. It works. I, I remember where okay. you were. I'm being honest. <laughs> Um, and then the last one is most of your electives uh, in social studies are 2.5 credits. I'd like to know why law is still a full year, five credits. Because the reason I asked the question, I know that the department head wants to go to an AP psychology. You've reduced psychology from a full year to a 2.5 credit. Psychology is an area, and going to AP really I don't think has anything to do with the other. But psychology is an area in which most of the kids are going to take in college. I would say that 90% of them are going to have to be, at some point in time in their, in their post-secondary education, exposed to a psychology course. But not all of them are going to be exposed to a law course. And yet all of our law courses are a full <coughs> year, five credits, and psychology is 2.5. It just defies logic for me. This year was the first year we did open up one of the law courses as a semesterized. Uh, so there's one that was semesterized. But there, there's two. That, I believe the on is, is is a full year. Yeah. And the, the, the CP was semesterized. There were some kids uh, that, that did come in at the January. Uh, there's that, only one that's full year? There's the honors course. The honors is, is the only year, one. Correct. I, know, I saw one for five credits. Yeah, it's the honors course. Um, the CP one can be taken either way. It's he's got to divide it up that it can be semesterized. There oh, full year. Or five full credits. Year. Okay. Right. But so there it's is, two. Just, just so we're clear, that right. is one of the. Um, when, we, we actually have to cut people off from that. And, and no, I understand it's road, very popular. Maybe no, down the road it, it, it That's not my question. Right. My question is not as popularity right. or anything else, and I'm not making inferences about sure. anything. My, my question is solely that if we're really trying to prepare our kids to, to, to meet with success at the post-secondary level, we know they're going to take psychology. Right. We're not sure they're going to take law. True. Like I said, we only can say what we teach, not how long we teach it or how we teach it. Correct. That's in your ballpark, gotcha. but I have to, I have to, I have to question it because sure. logic would dictate that to me it doesn't make that much sense. And, but and staffing wise, it, it may be something we do end up having. Well, anyway, that, that, that's up to you. That, but that's just so you, we're clear, there is a distinct possibility yeah. at the very least. And then the last question would be semesterized. And then the last question is: put my mind at, re at rest on some of the uh, courses. Uh, in business technology. A lot of these courses are pretty old because I know the guy to put them in. 
Yeah, you're looking at I'm looking at them. Um, and, and I know why you're taking them out, because you, they're not offered or we don't have the facility anymore. Right, okay. and it's, it's, not of, something, it's not something that I want to... Of, you know, these, of these courses, how many are being dropped because we don't have the facility anymore or the teacher? Well, it's two different aspects. The, the Ballpark. 60% of them, facilities and teacher? At least. At so least. it wasn't that it didn't have interest. It does, it's just that we don't have the facilities or the teacher to teach these courses. Is that correct? At this point, yes, but I would venture to say the point the that I'm trying to make is made, when they when they start saying that minimum school spending is good, and that it's a wonderful place to be, you can look at this experiential education right here, and this is all experiential and technical right. education that is no longer available. I walk down the end of the hallway. There are three classrooms with about an average of fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment sitting vacant right now. Uh, you know, in, in the middle of the day, because of, there's, there's a basically a right. two thirds of a teacher and, down. And, there. and it's not because of my bias, although it is a certain degree. You know, um, it's just uh, you know these these programs and with these hands-on programs that these kids can really wrap their hands around and their minds around uh, are so good for them. And uh, unfortunately, we've had to cut and make severe cuts. And no one seems to see the cuts. I'm just pointing it out that these courses are being dropped because we don't have teachers for them and we don't have facilities for them. Right. And I want an accurate representation in front, to be so in, front saying, in front of the students. So you're saying about 60% of them is for that reason? 60. And I'd say the major, a large percentage of that is because of staffing. Thank you. Jeff? Thank you. Uh, I don't really have any questions about the course of studies. I think it's a thoughtful review, and I commend both of you for the for the efforts that, that you're doing. Um, I do have one concern. Can you tell me how much an AP class test costs to take? Seventy. Uh, Seventy-nine dollars right now. Seventy-nine dollars. Mm -hmm. I hate I'm the. Sorry, now is ten dollars because the state just uh, announced a, uh, a, a grant for those students so it's ten dollars uh, it's okay. a huge a huge and, and these kids were, were told last year this isn't new to, to the, yeah. I, 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 think we're just I, I hear you but I must tell you I just hate to nickel and dime parents and students and I'd love to hear Jessica's thoughts on this as well as yours Debbie but mm -hmm. it just seems to me that and I know you're looking at the instruction of the AP courses, and that's obviously a very important thing. But it just seems to me that maybe as a compromise, we could create uh, an incentive system where if you get, uh, I don't know, three or more, something Jeez, that's not a bad idea. like that. Did you, uh, wow. Uh, that's we, a good we, idea. We get, wow. Uh, I know I mentioned it to Jessica and I mentioned it to the mm -hmm. student leaders, but we are working uh, with a company that's we're looking to have them match uh, our, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll front some money and, and they're gonna match whatever money I front. And uh, it's funny you should say that because we're going to be basically, uh, it, it's not necessarily a, a reimbursement, so to speak, but it would be a gift card uh, to a, a business that teenagers would uh, would frequent, let's put it that way. And it's it's not nothing to do with food. Um, <laughs> um, Broccoli? <laughs> but I, 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 we're in we're in discussions. That now. is a going, food group, just so you know. It, it, we're in discussions now, and it's going well, and, and, and it's not official yeah. yet. But I will be in front of you in the spring uh, to come up with an incentive plan. Uh, Texas does this, it, it, it partially funded by the state, but we're going to fund it ourselves, and uh, we have a company that's going to be matching it. It will basically be a gift card for uh, if they get a, a three, they'll get a fifty dollar gift card. If they get a four, it's a seventy five, and if they get a five, it's a hundred. So. Uh, we're on board with that. Uh, we're actually very close to being able to ask to be on the agenda. It might be another month, and we'll have it finalized with this company. Good job. But, uh, we're, Wonderful. We're, we're still we're still working out the logistics, please. but they're on board, which is important. Good job. Just please make it happen if I can it's, help. Please. It's, I just don't want to mention the no. company because it's not official. <laughs> yes, of course you can. Um, right now, I'm in um, two AP classes, and I know I would much rather spend the one hundred sixty dollars this year then have to take the course in college and spend a couple thousand. And I think most of the AP students know that going into the course. So they understand that while it may be a lot of money right now, they're saving a lot of money if they do well in the test. I understand that. It's still a fee. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. But 
if you do well. If you what you just said well. was extremely rational, and you've obviously <laughs> taken economics and all that kind of Let's stuff. So I, next year. <laughs> so I applaud. I applaud all that. I still hate thieves. Yes, but I, I, I think it gets back it. to what your concern is about level funding and minimum spending. You know, we it's very difficult. Um, we used to pay for some of the testing for the students. Um, the student paid for the first test and the school did pick up the rest of that and unfortunately as of last year we did have to have the students pick up the entire fee for the test. Um, as long as you're looking at an alternative I'm happy. Thank we you. We are. We are. We're in the process. I appreciate Rachel? Yeah. Oh, fine. Thank Jessica? you. Jessica? Um, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, one is again about the language department and if they did not successfully get proficient in the MCAS, you said you, they had to do that extra course in freshman year. When they go and start up foreign language again, would they, um, say if they took a foreign language class in the middle school, would they have to restart at say Spanish one, seeing as they had all that time off and weren't? Yes, okay. they would. I like that idea. Okay, Just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I know we may have talked about this before, but um, instead of having an AP calculus, would there also be an alternative for just a regular maybe calculus honors? Because I know I have, we have two classes of pre-calculus now, and the majority of them are juniors, so they obviously can't all fit into the AP calculus class, which would be next year. So they have that as an option, AP stats, and core math. Would there be a honors class that they would be able to they take They also have instead? a trigonometry as an option as well. Okay. But, um, we have, um, the, the interest has always been for just an AP calculus, but uh, again, this, especially when you get to the upper echelon courses and the electives, it's, it's really student driven. Certainly we have to have algebra one, geometry, algebra two, but the, uh, the extra courses, the electives and the, uh, uh, the challenge courses, if you will, are, are all gonna be student driven. Okay, and my last question is, in the beginning you were listing out the credits that they will be needing and you said that they would be needing um, five units for business, which would also include health. Can you list, like, say, which are the requirements that they must have? Yes, and I'm going to forward all of your PowerPoint. Unfortunately, I uh, wasn't able to, and it, it might be easy to see at your leisure as well, sometimes the screen. Um, but in regards to, let me get to that here. Um, oh, there you go. Oh, you, yeah. In regards to, uh, the additional uh, core courses for business tech, health, or technology is four and a half uh, units that are going to be required for that. With each unit being five credits. Yeah. Right, based okay. on a five credit yeah. kind yeah. of unit. <coughs> Anything else? I'm good. Good. Have just another? one more thing, and I, and I think that just coming another? from your comments, just it was the first question that I asked about student. Um, inclusion in the process of even if it's if it's not um, the the uh, the elective courses um, but going into this next time um, having a, a, a group of students um, maybe at the level when you are all together just not only to take a look at um, the courses being offered but then also maybe suggestions on um, how a certain um, course is the, the description of the course just might be good. Just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then the only other question that I had, um, well, first, can you combine death and dying in history and forensic science? Just go ahead and combine those together. Um, okay. I just, it was just uh, there's two different, you know, history and science, and I know they're completely two different courses, but it just seemed funny to me. Um, in the elective courses, I didn't see anything around medical, um, medical profession. Um, intro to nursing or any, was there any discussion about offering that as an elective, as, as a course uh, of study? You, you have to have the, the, the person that can teach it, and that's where we're at right now. We do have um, the, a child care, but it doesn't, it's not on the same level, um, child care and development. Um, but we just don't have the person that has those expertise in the science department at okay. this time. But we have in the past, with, we had a teacher that was uh, able to teach it and, and, and handle the curriculum. I will say that we're not here to talk about our schedule this evening and uh, we are looking at uh, some scheduling possibilities that will enable uh, more dual enrollment for our students. 
and uh, hopefully we'll be coming to you soon with Two weeks. The, um, a new schedule that uh, we'll talk about that will help, hopefully, again, help with uh, getting our students into these dual enrollment courses, whether it's at the college or maybe even at our high school. I know that uh, Ms. Rotella and I are looking into that with the local community colleges. Um, so that's definitely something that's uh, in the plans. And uh, also the possibility of offering some online courses as well for our students, which kind of got to your question before, I kind of wanted to uh, add that in as well. You know, maybe for some students that are interested in higher level maths, for instance, or AP courses that we don't offer, um, things like nursing, that, that type of thing. Hopefully with, between the dual enrollment and online courses that we're looking into, we'll be able to broaden um, our course of studies further than what you're seeing that's presented here this evening. Oh, great, I'd love to hear more about the online piece of it. And, and we're excited that we're actually creating a space uh, that when you come for the toll, we'll be ready. and. Uh, it's actually, we have an online room that's going to be up and running hopefully by the end of the school year. So we're, we're really excited. We've been working with Jan, and we're going to continue to work with Jan to have that in place for next year. Thank you. I'd like to uh, <coughs> wrap this up, if I could, um, and get the last word. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll have one more thing. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any other questions before I wrap it up? I, I, I've been on the school committee now, I'm running for my fourth term, and I think that <clears throat> this presentation that you've made has got, is one of the uh, most concise and uh, simplistic presentations and easy to understand, um, very, uh, you know, forward, um, and, uh, and uh, the rationales that you provided today, uh, even though I didn't agree with all of them, they made sense, and I think that that's very, very important. Um, I think uh, that uh, our program of studies is a reflection of where we are as an educational community. And I think, uh, as I said before, it's not um, within our purview uh, to determine how we teach a class or how long we teach a class. It's only within our purview to approve the classes taught. Um, so uh, your, first, uh, your first time out, you did a good job. This is uh, very insightful. And the other thing, too, is, um, you know, to make um, the program of studies, the actual booklet, reflect the actual uh, course offerings that we have uh, is certainly a, a step in the right direction. God knows that we haven't had some of these business technology courses run for, for years and years and years. So um, that, that in itself, to streamline uh, the book it, it, and to let it reflect reality is a, a tribute to you and Deb and, and the rest of the staff. Um, but the only thing I would say is I hope this has gone before the school council. I hope they have approved it. Um, yes. And certainly, uh, it, as you develop uh, students, I don't know if the, I don't know if there are any students on the school council, but certainly as you three, develop your leadership three, three team, seniors. certainly as you develop your leadership team in the future, uh, and we've talked about that before, um, student leadership, that uh, you know this may be presented to them. Um, not for a formal vote, but just an informal situation to uh, allow the kids to have some input uh, into what's being proposed. Um, I, I, I right now I would like to entertain a motion to accept this program of studies as presented. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero zero. And, and I just would like to thank you know Debbie and the department heads and the staff. This was a total team effort. This uh, we're here in front of you tonight, but there were a lot of people behind the scenes, clerical and whatnot, that were also involved in it. And we're excited that we can actually present this, and we have every intention and every capability of offering what's in front of us. Not every class, but if there is interest, we can offer those. So we're excited about that. And uh, we I thank you, you for coming tonight, Deb. Thanks again. Uh, we've got two, we've got two more agenda items for you, so we're not going anywhere. Oh, you do okay. <laughs> um, well, let's move along. Thank you very much. Thank What's you. next on the agenda? I can't even find Graduation my agenda. Graduation requirements. Graduation requirements. You're still up. <laughs> okay. And, and again, I will forward this to you um, via email tonight. But uh, just to give everyone historical uh, data, the graduation requirement has been 115 credits uh, for at least the last six or seven years and possibly more. Uh, we are going to be in front of you in two weeks uh, presenting a, a plan for a, a schedule and it's going to allow for us to offer more credits based on that schedule. Uh, we also have the Mass Core 
that as it sits right now, without looking at, and this is page uh, seven of your uh, course of studies book, it, it is actually, when you add up their requirements, they're already at 120 for the, gra for the class, graduating class of 2014. And we're so at what now? We're at, a, I'm sorry, uh, that's 120. We're at 115 right now. So it's 120 with the, uh, with the mass core. So uh, as I mentioned, there are some changes in, mostly in math and science and foreign language now being a requirement. Those are the, the, the big changes. Uh, adding a, a, a half unit of art, um, and that's a, a small change, but that is a, a change nevertheless. So right away, we're looking at, at this point in time, we need to go to 120 uh, just to satisfy the mass core. But I don't want to just be satisfying the mass core. If we can offer opportunities by being creative with a schedule and, uh, and, and coming up with an eight period uh, schedule, which is what we're going to be presenting to you in, a, in, a, in two weeks, I would like to move forward and increase the, uh, the credit requirement or the unit requirement, if you will. Uh, we base our major courses, which are year long, the Carnegie unit we use is five. It's a little confusing, and down the road we're going to be looking to make some changes in that, but for, the, for next year, that's where we're at. So a half year course or semester course is two and a half credits, and, and again, and when we add up the mass score, they're at 120. We're currently at 115. So basically, we're looking for next year to go to an eight period schedule. With that eight period schedule, that right now we're on a seven period schedule. It gives us an additional opportunity for one unit or, or five credits for each year they're in school. So therefore, I am here in front of you today proposing that for the uh, graduating class of 2012, based on the fact that they're gonna have an additional opportunity for five credits, we increase the requirement for the class 2012 to 120 credits. <coughs> the class of 2013, because they'll have two years of that additional period to 125, class of 2014, which is the first graduating class underneath the Mass Corps, they'll have three opportunities to have that extra period to increase that to 130 credits. And then for the class of 2015 and beyond, 135 credits, because they'll have four years of an extra period. And I think th that makes sense to us. It, it's not, I, I, based on it, they still have the same opportunity uh, for makeup, if you will, credit makeup. It, it, I don't anticipate there'll be a change in, in the dropout rate or the graduation rate because they'll still have those opportunities for some reprieves, if you will. Um, I can't speak for the committee. I'm hearing it for the first time. Um, the only thing um, that I question is whether or not we should wait until we finalize exactly what's going to happen in terms of that schedule before we uh, entertain a, a formal vote on this. That's just my opinion. Uh, it's certainly, the, it's, it's the, the committee may yeah. may have another opinion on it, but um, it seems to me that uh, until we have a definite picture as to exactly where we're going to go with the schedule, um, that uh, uh, graduation what? requirement increase might I, going to 120 is not a big deal because it's going to go to 120 anyways probably because of the mass score. We don't have a choice with the 120. So, so we could vote on that tonight. But down, we're back but, here in two weeks. So right. I mean, it's, but further along, uh, I think it might be a little, just a little premature. Maybe not. I don't know. Whatever the other, whatever the committee members think. Anybody? Jeff, uh, I, I agree with you, but I have one question. Just mm, sure. Just Do so you. I understand the, so to speak, the math. Right. At one forty, if I divide that by four. The highest goes is 135, right? Five. I thought you were eventually getting to 140. Oh, was uh, it 135? 135 is, is the uh, two class is of 2015 and beyond. Okay, sorry. Okay, at 135, can I divide that by four to get the number of credits expected to be achieved each year? Uh, it will be a, 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 less, it will be a little bit less. Four years. It will be a little bit less. Correct. So what does that mean if I'm going to get to 135? How would you envision that being distributed over the four years? Well, that's a minimum. That's oh. the threshold. Okay. Uh, we have kids like Jessica will graduate with probably 130 some odd credits next year. So it's just a minimum that they have to have to meet the mass core requirement 
to meet our local requirement and the state requirement. So if I, just using simple math, if they had seven five credit courses over a given year, that's 35 times four is 140. Right. So is that what you're talking about? Well, let me, let me, let me maybe I can explain this a little bit better for you. Okay, right now, as you just did the math, they can attain 140 <coughs> credits, okay? Under the current schedule or the under proposed? Under the current, current schedule. schedule. Okay. Yeah, under the proposed schedule, they can, they can attain a, 160 because it's basically 40 credits times four years. So the, the, seven, the, the current schedule, assuming no study halls, right. they could take seven courses and that's how they get to the, to the 35. Correct. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else to be said on this particular part of it, the graduation requirements? Uh, does the committee want to vote on next year? Or do you want to, what do you want to do? I, I would. I mean, I know that we discussed here a couple times when you presented in front of us about study halls and how many there are today and stuff, but I, I would feel more comfortable just taking a look at the schedule. Um, so if it, if you, if you don't need us to vote tonight, I think that it would go hand in hand That's with fine. once we see what the schedule we're, we're looks like. We're totally fine with that. And um, uh, in two weeks, we'll have a better uh, better vision of where things line up. But the goal, just so we're all clear moving forward, is to eliminate study halls. Um, we want kids in eight classes per year. Um, and we're hoping that the staffing will support that. So that's where well, we're that's at. another question completely. I, isn't I understand, <laughs> but I just want to, that's, you know, there's uh, know. 150 kids in study hall, fifth period, and we want to make that zero next year. Yeah. Just a quick question, would for, and I know I can wait two weeks from now, but just real quick, would, if you are going to offer an online course, would that count as one of the classes? It could, or it could be done after school as well. So it, it, the nice thing, thing about the classes. online is we're going to offer them uh, eight periods a day, and uh, and if it doesn't fit into a schedule, like Jessica may be taking. I was about to say, so Jessica could graduate eight. with 250 credits if you <laughs> went to offer. <laughs> well, online. well, that's true. Uh, she could graduate. That is true. She could graduate from college right. in her go. senior <laughs> year, right before she well, goes. Okay. She she could. <laughs> Logistically, it may be <laughs> an okay. issue, but I'll but we're excited about weeks. that as Thanks. well. Okay, so um, do we have a consensus from the board that we're going to wait for two weeks? Okay. All right, move, move on. Next item of business. You're up. We're up again. Um, <laughs> Construction, destruction. The, um, I, I know a few years back uh, you had to go in front of the school committee for any type of construction or destruction. Not only lately. This is the Sylvia policy. Oh, oh, we have a different name for it at the high school, but we'll go with yours. Um, um, basically, we have an area in the library because everything is stored now digitally. Um, we, we have an area that is underutilized and basically it was like a periodical storage area that is now kind of obsolete because everything is either digital or online. Um, Dr. Rabinovich. Is that over to the right as you walk in? When you in? walk in, it's to the left. To the right is our, is our tech uh, room for okay. our computer. Okay, I, I know what it is. Opposite side. Yeah. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Dr. Rabinovich, uh, Jay Hurd, Christian Fernandez, who's here, there he is, and uh, Tom Tricker and myself met in regards to uh, getting WCTV to be into the building. Uh, Christian does a great job of getting in there, but he doesn't have a, a home base in our building. And, and what I've been able to see in, in some of the neighboring districts uh, for the local cable access to actually have a spot in the building, it's, it's mutually beneficial. Um, because basically what it, what it allows, it allows a, a better connection between WCTV and the Wayham Public Schools, and it also creates more opportunities for our students, both uh, before school, during school, after school, uh, with different activities that they're involved in in our school. We have a live feed in the next room over, which happens to be our current uh, in-school studio. There'll be, uh, this proposed area would have a door uh, that will be adjacent to our uh, in-school studio where we run our in-school announcements and our own uh, morning show. Basically, what I'm here today, and, and I'll, I'll email you the pictures, um, they, they came out okay on the digital camera, um, but basically what we're asking is to enclose a, a walkthrough area, if you will. And uh, this would still allow two means of egress uh, out, of the, uh, out of the AV room and out of the uh, soon-to-be WCTV room. Um, 
but basically it's, a, it's again an obsolete area. It's not a large enough area to be utilized as a classroom. And um, we're excited, uh, Christian and I have, have, have had some conversations on this and uh, I know he's excited. He's already got a mailbox and an ID for the school, but we're excited to get him in and get him uh, involved working with our students. So this is not what used to be the computer room in the library. It, it, it's not that where you were last no. year? You know where the librarian's desk is? Yes. Um, behind, behind her? Behind that, there's a, a sort of a half wall of yes. an area where all this that's yes, a lot of shelving. So uh, there's already a door there that goes into the AV room now. So yes. we're just talking about, because of the equipment, and obviously there's a lot of expense there um, to keep it secure. So it's not, not going to be like a big studio. It's just going to be a no. place to hang out. It's well, no, <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's going to be a studio. Yeah, studio? Yeah. It's going to be kind of a half studio. Okay. More new style. Okay. More desk in there. All right. Not for me to sit at. Okay. Okay. And so you're looking just to close up, close off a door. We're looking to close up the wall for the picture you have there, and um, basically, um, it, it's it's just a, a walkthrough at this point in time, if you will. There's not a door there. It's really a, a simple. Just frame it up, put the drywall, plaster it, and paint it, and, and um, off we go. No problem with the expense. Um, We'll hit you up for that. No, no, this we've got. Yeah, to, it's up for that. <laughs> no, there's uh, tonight. It, tonight, it's, we'll, it's, it's, we'll pass, we'll pass the, hat. the hat around. Yeah. We, we've um, we basically budgeted uh, working with the custodians. We're, we're looking at about 120 dollars, including the paint. And, and so what uh, you need is our permission to close up a wall. That's all I'm asking for. All right. Any questions? Just a comment. Um, that's okay. Um, one of the things yeah, that came ahead. after came out of the uh, youth forum, and we said it earlier today that um, as a follow up to the Martin Luther King breakfast and the students that got uh, awarded at that breakfast, there was a youth forum where the students came together. You probably know about it because you bust them over. Right. Um, one of the things that came out of there was uh, a recommendation to do more programming um, out of the high school, out of the middle school, and so I think this is really. Um, I think it's a great idea if it is going to encourage that type of thing um, only because it's it's sorely needed in this community more um, student voices heard through WCTV talking about the issues and the needs you know really giving them more voice so I know that there are some programming but if this could encourage that um, I'm 100% behind it. And then we'll just add you as a, um, as a teacher in the electives. So you can <laughs> adjunct faculty. Okay, anything else? I want to take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we grant Mr. Palladino permission to make the necessary renovations up to $250. Um, anything in excess of that probably should come back to us. Any second? Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get get your putty knife. <laughs> Drywall knife. <laughs> um, been there. Before we go on with any further business, um, I'm remiss. Uh, I had a, I was reminded uh, by one of the board members, um, and uh, I think at this point in time, uh, I would be remiss as your chair, and the board would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge publicly uh, the contributions of Dr. Gleason, who just passed away. Uh, for many, many years, Sherm Gleason was the school doctor. Uh, he was everyone's doctor in town. He was probably the last doctor in town to sit on the edge of a bed and uh, to check on the kids. Uh, and he just did so much for this town 
uh, so much for the school department and uh, so much for young people uh, and his legacy will certainly live on to the Y and whatever. And I think it would be appropriate if we just took this time, if we all could, just take a moment of silence and silent tribute to Dr. Gleason. Thank you very much. Dr. Rabinovich, acceptance of gifts. I would like to recommend the acceptance of the following gifts with thanks. A display case from the Wareham Free Library to Ware, the Wareham High School Art Department. That's the first gift. Do I have a motion? Motion uh, to accept the case. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero zero. I'd also like to recommend the acceptance of a $500 gift from Walmart to the Minot Forest School to purchase food and supplies for the annual Jump Rope for Heart event. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero zero. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Uh, next order of business. I'd like to have a brief conversation about rescheduling uh, April's meeting. Um, Mr. Fonts, I don't, I think he is uh, in favor of this also, but I'm not sure. He's right. Is, is he here? Oh, okay, there he is. Um, the election day is the 5th. Wednesday, we're scheduled to have a school board meeting on the 13th. That 13th, would be the re, uh, reorganization meeting. Uh, I am suggesting that we move the meeting of the 13th to the 6th and have the reorganization meeting on the 6th. And the reason I'm suggesting that is that uh, several of us will be away at NSPA. So, um, that's my suggestion, but it probably would need some kind of a motion. The 6th is the day after election? Day after election, which would be the reorganizational meeting. So you got to get yourself squared, sworn so in. So we're assuming the two members will be sworn in by then? Well, yeah, I'll assume that we don't get beat. <laughs> motion. I make a motion to change the meeting from the 13th to the 6th. Second. Any discussion? Doesn't seem to be a conflict. No discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero zero. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, oh, no, someone has new business. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Eight minutes. I know. Eight minutes, okay. Jeff, I know you asked me on new business. Uh, quickly. Cape Cod Collaborative, we met tonight. Um, the Cape is doing fine. Enrollments are either at or above budget in terms of the major programs. Uh, they anticipate having a small surplus uh, at the end of the year based on the current run rate, unless they include uh, GASB 45, which for those of you who, who want to know about such things, that's the unfunded liabilities associated with providing health care, not pensions, but health care to their um, retired employees. If you include that, they've got a half a million dollar deficit. So they are running into the same issues uh, with regard to unfunded liabilities that regular school districts and towns, et cetera, are uh, running into. But otherwise, um, the, the collaborative is doing fine. Thank you for your efforts again. Not a problem. Um, I have two draft resolutions that I'm going to give to Michelle. Uh, for those of you who have been to, and I, that's probably just Cliff and myself, and I, well, Barry hasn't been a representative, obviously. Um, MASK at their annual meeting always has a bunch of resolutions. They come from, in some cases, um, school districts. I'm asking you to consider two resolutions. One is regarding teacher evaluations, and the other is regarding um, student achievement data and the use of them in, in uh, teacher evaluations. They're just for your consideration. 
if the school committee decides that they want to support them, um, then we would pa pass them on to Mass for consideration at the annual meeting. So if you would pass that down to Michelle, you'll be able to view them uh, for two weeks from tonight. And then um, as a result of the really good work that is, that is being done by Kenny and others on, um, on trying to get people to recognize the unacceptability of violence, I actually had a conversation with Mary, Ra um, Mary Walker uh, to see what kind of data actually existed and to see how that violence, if at all, related to student uh, behavior. Um, she referred me to the DESI website and I haven't succeeded in finding it yet, but unfortunately I did find a bunch of other student data um, and some of it concerned me. So I'm passing this also on to Michelle and Barry, you'll obviously want to take a look at that and I'd like um, perhaps the superintendent or someone he'd like to designate uh, to talk about that in two weeks and if not in two weeks, if the schedule's too full, uh, to talk about it at some future agenda because there are, there are things there where the trend isn't so good and I think we need to be aware of it and need to know what, if anything, we could do to, uh, to make the trends go in the, in the opposite direction. And then finally, just as a quick FYI, I attended along with others um, the Common Core, um, what do you call it, Barry, conference on Monday. The uh, rollout of the um, Common Core uh, curriculum standards. Yes. Actually, the taking Massachusetts standards with the national standards and putting them together. I wish I could say it was the most productive time I ever spent. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, they were not all that well prepared. They even admitted they weren't all that well prepared. <laughs> um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> nevertheless, I did learn one thing and that had nothing to do with Common Core standards, and that is that the task force associated with teacher evaluations um, had its final meeting on Monday, and the vote was 19 to 5 in favor of a major uh, revision to the, uh, the way teachers are evaluated. Um, several things, and then, I will, um, then I'll be finished. One is there will be four tiers. As compared to pass-fail, you'll actually be superior or the equivalent of superior satisfactory needs improvement and failing so four tiers um, there will be annual evaluations unless you're superior in which case you could be there'll be every other year um, and that's that's probably that's probably oh and there will be local um, it, they managed to get the recommendation to the state that it not be imposed, and this is critical, but that the local districts be allowed to bargain these evaluation changes as a part of collective bargaining. Um, those are the maybe the highlights. I will get a final copy from my contact um, of this and have more to say, or Barry will have more to say um, when, it's, when it's been finalized. But it's, it's happened though just it has to go through the process of being approved by the state board by the commissioner and the legislature which will not happen all until i was told today maybe by june first that it will become a mandate um and by the way if you're a level four district which we are not then you have to implement it for september of 211. yeah right Anyone else with new business? Rhonda? No. No? Anyone else? Now I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Adjourned. Aye. Second. We are adjourned. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.